I assume we're not having an executive session of that padlock? Correct. Correct. Presentations, staff presentations. Uh, staff and council, we can start eating anytime we want to. Brand is, Brandon is the least important one, so let's eat during his presentation. Well, Mayor, council, just uh, real quick, I wanted to introduce our new council members, in particular to Brandon Agamanin. Uh, he works with Focus Advocacy, which is our hired lobbyist. Uh, while we, Mayor and I will go down, and, and hopefully some of y'all will come with us uh, in future sessions, uh, frequently uh, their group down there is all down their feet on the ground all the time for us, and they do a lot of great work for us, and he's here today to tell you a little bit about it. So without further ado. Thank you, Andrew. I'm make sure I get this operating right. Okay. Fantastic. I'm Brandon Agamelian with Focused Advocacy. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, my firm uh, consists of uh, Snapper Carr, Kurt Seidlitz, Andrew Kiefer, Christina Kaini, and Elizabeth Vineyard. Uh, we've had the distinct pleasure and honor of working for and representing the city for a long time now and, and have a long track record of, of legislative, shared legislative uh, results and, and economic development projects and all kinds of fun stuff. I um, want to start by uh, thanking and acknowledging your uh, legislative delegation in Austin. Uh, Grand Prairie is unique um, uh, in that it has so many different uh, House members representing it. You see here uh, in seniority order presented from, from left to right, your House members that represent Grand Prairie and their current committee assignments with a little piece of information of how much of um, the city they represent. Uh, so you can see Representative Turner and Representative Gonzalez and Representative Mays have the vast majority of, of your... Oh, you zero he has a sliver of us but no people live in it yeah 176 people so it makes up and very very you would never know when we ask him to do so you have a very responsive delegation uh, they, uh, every, every one of them <laughs> i remember being down there with matt with, with you and i'm leaving afterwards say how many of us does he have he said not any voters <laughs> yeah <laughs> well my goodness you wouldn't have been able to tell for what he told me he was going to help us do on this, you know. So yeah. I agree with you. Very responsive. They are very responsive. We appreciate their open door policy. And then, of course, on your Senate side, Senator West, Birdwell, Hancock, and Powell. Powell being another example of, he has, you know, literally, I think, two people in the city. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Senator Hancock uh, has the, the vast majority. Uh, and you see their committee assignments there. So getting to the heart of the presentation, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. I want to discuss the, what I call the drivers of session, what really uh, was the kind of story behind the story, if you will. Talk a little bit about the leadership priorities between the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, and then get down to what didn't pass, what did pass, and then talk about the special session where we are. So, and by the way, I mean this to be conversational. I appreciate the mayor interjecting and encourage y'all to do the same. I'm gonna go as quickly as I can, just out of respect for your time, but happy to be interrupted and, and, and make this as conversational and valuable to you as possible. So uh, the drivers of session you see laid out here before you, it started uh, literally uh, about this time two years ago. Uh, where th uh, right after the last legislative session, the then Speaker of the House, Dennis Bonin, uh, as you might remember, was tape recorded uh, in a conversation saying some very unflattering things about his colleagues that he serves with in the House, and in particular saying some very unflattering things about city officials and county officials. Uh, that led to his uh, decision to step down after serving only one term as Speaker, and uh, not seek re-election. So anytime you have a massive change in leadership like that, a new speaker, that's going to have a real uh, ripple effect and an impact, and you're gonna definitely see that play out in the course of session. That alone would have been a big enough story of the session, a first term speaker coming on board. It was followed then by, of course, a global pandemic that literally brought the world to a screeching halt. Um, and brought the legislature to a screeching halt. We had no interim hearings. 
uh, which we normally have leading up to session and going into session. They basically were debating whether or not they were even going to be able to meet. You had then have the George Floyd death and the related protest, uh, the presidential election and those related protest, uh, and you had a lot of very unique elements going into session. So we start session with all of that, and just when we thought it couldn't get weird enough, we have this historic, gigantic winter storm. I share all these things not to recap the crazy year that was 2020 and 2021, but again to, to, to inform you that these are the items and the issues that really drove the session and drove what the priorities were and weren't. And so speaking of priorities, you see here what the governor then announced at the beginning of session were his priority items. In green, we have the items that pass. In red, we have the items that didn't pass. It is unusual for a governor's priority item or emergency item, as they are technically called, to not pass. So to see that much red on the board is unique and it foreshadowing that explains a lot about why we're in a special session right now because the governor said, I didn't get my items passed and I'm the governor, I'm gonna keep calling you back. Uh, the speaker, uh, the new speaker, Dade Phelan, uh, issues his priority items. You see here how they relate to many of the things that I just spoke of, you know, the Pandemic Response Act, the telehealth, telemedicine, which was also related to the pandemic, broadband related to the pandemic, election and ballot security related to the presidential election, reforming ERCOT down there at the bottom related to winter storm URI, so on and so forth. I'll skip over to the lieutenant governor's priority issues, and you see here where some things align, more power grid, ERCOT, broadband, election ballot security, and then you begin to see where things don't align. Uh, heartbeat bill, which is an abortion issue, abortion ban trigger, another abortion issue, stop taxpayer funded lobby. So you, you begin to see where the lieutenant governor, and he goes on to have 30 priorities, stop corporate gun boycotts, stop local police defunding, which is related to the George Floyd, so fair sports and women's and girls, SB 29 down there. So you begin to see where leadership is not aligned. And that again was a real story of session, explains a lot about how we ended up here. That said, we had a, a somewhat typical session in at least one sense, and that is the volume. Uh, it is always drinking from a fire hose. 7,000 bills introduced in a, about a 140-day span. Uh, 1,800 of those passed, which is higher than normal, so they actually ended up being a very active legislature despite a very slow start. And you see there, and for those of you that are maybe new to this, that city-related bills introduced 2,000 plus of these 7,000 bills. Cities have more issues before the legislature than any entity under the sun by far. There is no close second place. There is no close second place. The next closest is public schools and they are a distant, distant second. And that is because cities provide so many services. You do so many things. So it is almost only natural that the legislature ends up introducing a lot of bills that affect your operations and your finances. In, in addition, you're a very large organization with lots and lots of employees. And so again, only natural that cities are very, very active in legislature. So enough of the uh, kind of overview and high level stuff, let's get down to the real details here. This, the session is really, I think, more dis best described by what did not pass, uh, which is a good thing because the last few sessions, for those of you that have been around know, the legislative session has been more described by some pretty rough and, and bad bills that passed that, that were hard for cities to, to handle the last, I would say, two, two to four years. This was a, a, a much, softer session on us in that regard. There were still a number of very bad bills proposed. You see them here, uh, a, a very serious debate about changing how sales tax allocations would be made, sales tax sourcing as we call it, changing it from uh, uh, destination to origin. Uh, very serious bills that, that moved through the process, by the way. These are not bills that were just introduced and didn't go anywhere. These, most of these bills moved through the process, but eventually we were able to bottle up and kill. Brandon. Yes, sir. Since we have some new ones, I think it's very important for you to give a brief. How much 
we think the sales tax sourcing would have cost us. Staff, did, we came up with a number, didn't we? Millions. Oh, for this Millions. city in particular. I You're forget what the number was. But we're estimating it, worst case scenario, about $3 million. $3 million a year. Because let's take somebody like uh, Office Depot in 360, one of our, used to be one of our biggest sales tax generators. Even though you can't go in there and buy a ream of paper, all the sales tax that was done online was shipped out of there and showed it as a source. We got the sales tax off of it. Many of our big sales tax generators are in warehouses that you can't even go in and buy something. Mm -hmm. This is what it cost us big time. It still may someday. Mm -hmm. We don't think it's going away. It just didn't pass this time. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, no, that's point well made, Mayor. And I will use the opportunity also to um, thank staff here at City Hall for all their excellent work uh, providing that kind of information and that kind of data. Um, and all headed up by Andrew and Megan. And trust me when I tell you, I, I have the pleasure of working with cities across the state. I've been representing cities for the better part of 25 years now. Um, and your, your staff here is second to none, uh, starting with Tom and Steve and, and Andrew and Megan on down. So we greatly appreciate uh, all the, uh, their work and the, the support that they give us to, to go do our job there in the, in the halls of Austin, in the halls of the Capitol. Um, so uh, partisan city elections, uh, believe me, that bill had a lot of traction, which would have required, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, you the, the currently running in a nonpartisan capacity to put a, a, you know, a letter next to your name uh, for city elections. That bill is going to be back. And then you see here a lot of uh, what we call preemption and land use kind of legislation, uh, preempting the city from, from regulating Plumbers, uh, electricians, uh, that bill had a lot of traction. We were narrowly able to, to defeat that. Uh, what we call the shot clock bill, which, which uh, is a sort of a, a mandate that you uh, move your permits quicker. Um, removal of ETJ, that was a, a sort of a pop, what I call a pop-up issue. It seemed like that issue just would not go away this session. It just kept coming back. Uh, Landowners and developers frustrated about being in the ETJ and wanting a more expedited removal process. Uh, the Secretary of State having review over your ballot language and there being a cause of action uh, for your ballot action where, where uh, ultimately the Secretary of State could write your ballots for you uh, if you weren't curing them in a way that satisfied that office. Uh, believe it or not, that was a serious proposal and ha had a lot of traction. Uh, I jump over to Chapter 313, which is the school district property tax abatement tool that we created years ago. Um, that bill did not pass, and it needed to pass. It was sunset, and so that tool is now expired. Uh, it's, it's a little more useful in um, uh, industrial areas like down on the coast for um, um, uh, you know, chemical plants and things of the nature, uh, but that tool is now, is now gone. Uh, preemption of city employment of regulations and then lastly community what we call community censorship or the taxpayer funded lobby issue which you saw was a Dan Patrick priority uh, so I wanted to talk about that bill for a minute that was Senate Bill 10 uh, that that 10 means something that you don't become Senate Bill 10 by accident that means that the, the lieutenant governor thinks this is a real important issue so anytime you see a, a low bill filing number like that you you don't have to wonder how it got there uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick is very determined to uh, greatly roll back or limit uh, or eliminate your ability to advocate in Austin. So what that bill ultimately is passed out of the Senate said it only applied to cities and counties. It did not apply to school districts, hospital districts, any other kind of local government. It was, it was just picking on you. The justification were that, as Paul Bettencourt, the author of the bill, said on the Senate floor when asked, he said, quote, because that's how we did SB2. I, I never actually understood what that meant, but that was his answer. Um, what that bill did, it would have prohibited any city from joining an organization like TML if it had a registered lobbyist on its staff, which TML obviously does, and it would have prevented you from hiring an outside consultant who's a registered lobbyist, i.e. my firm. It also created a private cause of action where any citizen 
uh, could uh, file for injunctive relief and seek attorney's fees if they felt you were violating the bill. Um, I want to thank Mayor Jensen for being a, a very vocal uh, um, voice and, and, and activist on this issue, both during the interim when there was a, a, a very last minute interim hearing in the Senate and then during the course of session, uh, he had a lot of communication with Senator Birdwell in particular, and I think that helped shape this bill to at least be limited down to this, although we still think this is a very unacceptable bill. Uh, but in the past, there have been versions of this bill that said you couldn't have staff, for example, like Andrew Fortune or Tom Hart or, any, or Steve or anybody couldn't, you couldn't spend uh, public money on basically tracking the legislature. The House version of this uh, was ultimately very different. It was applied to all political subdivisions uh, and so created a much more kind of fair playing field. And it said you were banned from hiring a lobbyist unless you took certain steps like put your legislative agenda online, adopt that legislative agenda in a public hearing, all things that this city does. Uh, take a uh, explicit vote to approve the hiring of a lobbyist, which this city does and most cities do, and then would have then, regardless of that, even if you jumped through those hoops, it would have said that lobbyists can't advocate on certain topics, namely the 3.5 percent revenue cap, and would have banned us from the whining and dining, if you will. Um, that bill was ultimately passed uh, out of the House Committee and was set on the House calendar, uh, but certain members were determined to amend this bill and make it more like the Senate bill, so eventually the bill just died for lack of procedural action. So for the second session in a row, we, we find ourselves with the taxpayer-funded lobby issue um, still up in the air. Uh, moving on, uh, this was a, a, a City of Grand Prairie priority. Uh, um, the, the Grand Prairie Police Department uh, and the mayor uh, uh, it demonstrated a lot of leadership and, and this, I don't think this bill would have come to light were it not for this city. Uh, it was ultimately vetoed by the governor, uh, but it would require school districts, as you see there on the screen, to provide um, educational instruction regarding child abuse, family violence, dating violence. Uh, the governor's veto uh, expressed his concern about parental rights and, and safeguarding those parental rights and, and some kind of opt out, if you will. Uh, the, this city uh, urged this issue to be included in the special session, and it was. Um, so it was, it was added to the call. Uh, and Senate Bill 9 by Senator West, who was the author of the original bill, I'm very appreciative for Senator West's uh, leadership on this. Uh, it, it's been heard in the, in the Senate committee, uh, but we'll talk more about special session in a minute. Uh, so those are the bills that did not pass that are of interest to cities. There's a million other bills we could talk about, but this is the, the highlights. Here's just real quickly on a few bills that did pass. Uh, House Bill 1869 was a really troubling piece of legislation as it was originally filed, it would have greatly complicated the city's ability to issue certificates of obligation in particular and some other forms of debt. Um, and it had sort of this mechanical convoluted way of, of forcing voter approval. The bill didn't just come right out and say you have to have voter approval. The bill instead said, in essence, you can issue the debt if you want to, but if you don't have voter approval, we're going to make you count that debt on the M&O side of your property tax calculation instead of on the debt side. As, as you all probably know, you have two different sides of your property tax calculation, M&O and debt. Debt obviously stays in debt. This would have had this sort of convoluted way of forcing debt to count against your M&O. Um, what we were able to do through the hard work of, of people like Chris Turner in your delegation and many others and, and, and with the help of other cities, we were able to get the author of the bill to take a host of exemptions. Uh, and, and some of those include, as you see there, water projects, sewer projects, um, equipment, public safety, that was a big one. Uh, parks, another really big one that we worked on in particular for this city, TIFFs. We were able to include TIFFs in the exemption list. 
So there's a host of things now that, that in statute say you can still issue the debt. And your bond council going forward will have lots of conversations with you all about this bill anytime you want to issue COs, whether or not it now fits within this new statutory framework, or if it doesn't, then whether or not you want to take it to the voters. And then, as I said at the beginning, even if you don't, you, you can still issue the debt. It's just going to count against your cap. So the world of debt got a lot more complicated, but I don't think in a way that really hamstrings you too badly. Uh, so that was a really important bill. And then another bill that was, again, much like the, um, the, the bill that got vetoed by the governor, this bill passed, uh, thanks to the hard work of Senator Hancock and Representative Turner. This was a, a city of Grand Prairie priority that allows this council to designate uh, in, a, in a public meeting a zone uh, on city-owned land where you can have um, open container. I always have to say that very carefully because I'm always uh, tempted to say open carry, and that's the wrong term. Um, this is open container. Uh, and the, the idea here is to uh, be able to have, uh, you know, in and out alcoholic beverage carry in your Epic Central Park, in your Epic Central Zone. Uh, that bill was passed um, and is now uh, goes into effect September 21. So that tool will be in your toolbox going forward. A couple more bills to highlight here in terms of what did pass in the uh, uh, stop the defund the police. Uh, movement that, that um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick in particular made a priority. You see Senate Bill 23 passed. This is the version that applies to the counties, uh, and, and it's the five largest counties. But of course, you, this city straddles between two of those five, so you have on both sides of, of your city a, a new law that says that if the county reduces the police department budget or the law enforcement budget without voter approval, then those property tax revenues for the county will be frozen. Uh, so a, a pretty draconian uh, uh, impact if a count, if one of these uh, urban counties that the bill applies to decides to take that action. On the municipal side, you have House Bill 1900. It applies only to cities over 250,000 in population, and it takes a sort of different path to get somewhat to the same place. The, the wrinkle here is that for the municipal side, this determination will be made by the governor's office, uh, which is very sub, uh, subjective in some ways, and there's not a whole lot of detail in the statute that guides the governor's office, so they have some some... Uh, you know, subjectivity there, if you will. But basically, if a governor declares that your city is a, quote, defunding municipality, then all of these bad things happen here that are bullet pointed for you. You, you lose your annexation powers for 10 years. Any area that you did annex uh, becomes disannexed in the last 30 years. Your property taxes are frozen, and the state will withhold your sales taxes and send them to DPS. Um, and then there's a, an exception that tries to address the issue of if your total budget was going down and your law enforcement budget was going down with that overall decrease, then as long as it was proportional, then maybe the governor's office won't declare you a defunding municipality. Both of these bills, 23 for the counties and 19 for the cities were must-pass bills. Uh, this was uh, inevitable that they were going to pass something. Um, and so I'm not at all surprised that they made it through. And then with regards to the winter storm uh, that we had, they passed Senate Bill 3, which uh, does a number of things, but also does a lot of punting, if you will, to the PUC. Um, with, and specifically with regards to how the PUC is going to address the financial fallout uh, and the surcharges that are really starting to hit. Uh, I know that uh, Andrew uh, reached out to our office the other day for some assistance to help with some of the surcharge issues that are starting to crop up here. So we're digging into that with you. Uh, but Senate Bill 3 was, was the legislature's response. So that's a little bit about what did pass. Let's wrap up by talking about where we are now. So as you probably know, on July 8th, the governor 
as I alluded to earlier, said, hey, some of my stuff didn't get passed. We're going to have a, a quote-unquote special session. These sessions, as you, as you might know, they last 30 days. That's by constitution. The governor can call them in an unlimited capacity. And they don't have to go the full 30 days, by the way. I've been a part of a lot of special sessions that lasted just a few days. They come in, they get the bill passed, they go home. Um, this was a very aggressive, for lack of a better word, or maybe a better word would be a comprehensive agenda uh, that was laid out. This is a, a rather long list of issues to address in special session, some related to those priority items like bail reform and, and election integrity uh, that did not pass. And then some of them are newer things like the critical race theory and the social media censorship. You see their article X, that's Roman numeral 10, article 10 funding. That was the governor vetoing the legislature's appropriation uh, in the budget. The governor has line item authority. And when the Democrats walked out on the last day and killed the election bill, the governor's response to that was to veto their funding. So the legislature, in a matter of days, is out of funding. And um, the impact of that would be just like if this city did not have funding. Staff will not be paid. Uh, there's a number of legislative branch agencies that employ hundreds, thousands of employees. Uh, they will be out of a job. Uh, and the legislative offices will not be able to operate. So we're, 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 we're treading into to some unique um, Aries here. So the governor calls him back thinking that that, let, that Article 10 funding will sort of be the uh, wedge issue to, you know, make them stay. But as you see here and as you've been reading, it became national news. Uh, the Democrats decided to, to break quorum and walk out again. They have uh, taken uh, refugee in, in Washington, D.C., uh, where uh, the governor's uh, long arm of law enforcement cannot reach them and, and bring them back because otherwise they can. When, when you break quorum, if the speaker and the lieutenant governor uh, and or the governor uh, issue a call, they can come arrest you as a lawmaker and force you to come back to Austin and uh, report to duty, but not when they're in D.C. So we're in some very unprecedented waters. We've had walkouts before. We've, we've had uh, Democrats flee to other states in, in, in the past, not any time recently, but it's happened before during my time. Uh, but this is, this is um, getting to be uh, a, a bit of a unique level, if you will. So we've got about 18 days left in this session. Uh, we go to August 6th. The governor has said publicly, I'll call as many special sessions as possible. So hang on, I don't, I don't know exactly where we'll go. Real quick here, you see what has happened. The Senate has fully passed a number of these <clears throat> items, I think that's all of them, uh, off of the governor's call. Uh, but the House, where they've really broken quorum, they've, as you can see, at best they've passed a few bills out of committee, but they haven't been able to, to take anything to the floor uh, because they can't, they can't meet. Uh, in the background, we have yet more fun going on. This is a redistricting year, as you probably know. Because of the pandemic, the census data was not available. We would have otherwise been drawing the maps during the regular session, which would have been one of the first things I would have mentioned in a normal year. But there's been nothing normal lately. Um, so we're going to come back again at some point when the data is available, we anticipate that being around September, October to draw the maps. And then also the COVID uh, federal money is finally arriving and the legislature needs to appropriate and decide what to do with that $16 billion plus. So we're gonna have a special session about that. I, I, uh, I hope that made some sense. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? But Tom, go ahead. Really, just for our newer council members, uh, let me just uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, um, focused advocacy has repped us for, gosh, I don't know, 12 years. It's 
kind of blurred together. Uh, over that time, I have to say, they have uh, hit some home runs for us. Uh, there's lots of little things they do, but, I, I, but I, it's the big things that uh, we, we just can't say enough about. Uh, our hotel bill last year, I mean, unbelievable if we hadn't have gotten that through, that, that could have killed our project out there. And uh, we, we are estimating that's gonna bring in about 25 million of state money. That's huge for us. Uh, there's been other items going back that uh, maybe not that magnitude of money savings, but were just huge issues. So I wanna thank them and, and say they've done us a great job. It's been, uh, been a pleasure to work with them. They're always accessible to us whether it's up here and we're on the phone or whether it's down there. Uh, a lot of people do not understand that, that a lot of people think they just work for us during the session. That's not the case. Uh, a lot of their work last year was uh, in between the session when we were down uh, meeting with, uh, with the, comptroller. the comptroller and the uh, comptroller's office and having those meetings to get that through. So Brenda and I, uh, Sorry, I won't be hearing any more of your reports, but come by the house later, you could tell me. Okay. No, I'm joking, do not do that. <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'll wait till it comes out in uh, video. But thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with you and you have repped our city very well. So thank you. And not, not just you, but when Brandon's not available, we use other members of the firm also. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any? Anything else or any questions or comments? John? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Brandon, um, during the 86 um, regular session, we heard a lot about House Bill 2439, which deals with the building materials that builders can use, cannot use. Can you highlight that bill for us again? And I know that in talking with some of the advocate, I guess, interest groups <laughs> on the other side, I know they talked about you know, coming back during th this session and doing something different or adding more to it. Did that ever come about? And if so, what was, what were they trying to do? Great question. Um, so let's take that in the order that you, you, you laid it out. Speak the, up the, just a little bit, Brandon. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the bill last session, uh, the quote unquote building materials bill was another example of, a, of what we call a preemption bill that says, uh, state law is going to preempt city from regulating or otherwise enforcing um, certain building material requirements for um, residential commercial construction. Um, and I, forgive me, don't remember all the details of the bill off the top of my head, but a relatively straightforward bill and basically said it was an attempt by the stakeholders as you as you described in the kind of the building community and the development community to say we want a, a uniform national set of rules or statewide set of rules if you will and we don't want <clears throat> community by community to have their own um, characteristics of, of how they want buildings constructed so that was the bill that passed it was a it was a bad piece of legislation in our opinion last session this le leading into this session there was some talk about uh, cities wanting to readdress that bill if they could i would say to to continue to answer your question one i think the pandemic and the awkwardness of this whole session ended up uh, um, tamping down some of those conversations and some of that spirit second answer to your question is there was a bill that was passed uh, by the author of last session's bill, Senator Don Buckingham, that exempted um, one of her communities from her bill, uh, Horseshoe Bay, uh, which is a, kind of a exclusive high dollar community um, down in the Highland Lake area uh, outside of Austin. And then there was a, a house member that um, uh, did some tinkering with exemptions if you're a quote-unquote dark sky community. Uh, so there was a little around the edges, if you will, in terms of moderating that, but it was, it was very small. Uh, so I think if, if cities want to, re to address that issue, uh, again, they're going to have to really get organized and, and make a real strong push 
to bring forward a compelling case as to, as to why that law should be changed. And I don't mean to put words in your mouth that you're advocating for change. I'm sorry if I did that, but it, I, I, I just no, sort of just, assumed. I know that, you know, looking at zoning and, and trying to figure out what landowner rights have, I mean, as a city, we, we could do certain requirements, but when it comes to building materials, as far as how that house is going to look like or what materials on there, it kind of ties our hands indirectly to, to up to a certain point. So I just wanted to make sure especially the new members to understand as we're looking at different developments and, and future land use maps, how that plays into that factor. Um, you did mention the tax release, uh, relief, property tax relief efforts. Mm -hmm. um, high level, what do you think that bill would have done or not done for residents? So the governor put that on the call. Uh, so I think we're very much in the to be continued, to be determined. Um, so uh, there's some estimates uh, in, you know, that are beginning to um, uh, come forward uh, recently that say that maybe as much as cutting property taxes in half. Um, and of course, as, as everybody on this council probably knows, the property tax bill is the, the majority of that is the school district. Um, and then, you know, the, the remaining portion of that is the city and the county. Uh, so the state buying down that school district portion of it is really where their focus is um, because they have the, the ability to do that. Um, I, you know, if I were a, a betting person, I would say uh, there's a pretty good chance they're going to do something. Um, I think, if for nothing else, for the, the political um, goodwill of it, um, <coughs> property taxes are just a, a you know, very unpopular thing. So it's always, it's always tempting for the legislature to, you know, from a political standpoint, to want to address that. Um, so I, I think there's a good chance something will get done. And that, of course, is assuming that at some point we get enough people back in the chamber to start meeting again. Anybody else? Mayor, if I may, uh, the city manager mentioned the hotel bill and your hotel projects. I didn't have a slide on it, but I did want to also share and, and, and thank Representative Turner uh, for his work. Uh, we were able to, with a sort of a last minute amendment when a bill was on the floor, continue to enhance uh, the incentives that um, Grand Prairie can access through the state. Uh, in particular at the at the Joe Pool site. Uh, so uh, another, I think, positive development for this city in terms of en enhancing its, its um, you know, economic development toolbox. Uh, and so very thankful for Representative Turner uh, and Senator Birdwell as, uh, as well for uh, helping to get that bill passed. It wasn't something that the city asked us to do. It wasn't a priority of the city. We just saw an opportunity and uh, took advantage of it. Thanks. <clears throat> Senator um, Birdwell, it's nice that you mentioned that. He's not always the most helpful for us, So, but this session he did on a couple of uh, Representative Turner always is, but it was nice uh, to see kind of that other side of Senator Birdwell, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Yes, was, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It was very nice. So. Uh, well, and I told I, Andrew the meeting I had with him down there. I left and I said, that's the best meeting I've ever had. I'm in the hallway. I said, it's the best meeting I've ever had with Birdwell. It just, I don't know. Well, I, and I'll give you full credit for uh, your tenacity and, and, your, and your willingness to continue those conversations with him. It made a tremendous difference in getting that bill passed. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We appreciate it, Mr. Anybody Manager. Else? Brandon, always a pleasure. Thank y'all for having me. I appreciate it. Look forward to visiting tell, with y'all again soon. Tell the rest soon. of them how far us. I will. Thanks. Next on the agenda. Council. Um, tonight we have David Jones with Freeson Nichols. As everybody's aware, we um, 
uh, tasked Freeson Nichols to do a comprehensive plan update for a small area plan, what we're classifying as or categorizing or naming hmm. as Southgate. Uh, this area is from Raglan all the way down to our limits of our ETJ. Um, and he's just going to kind of go over the final draft of the plan and get your thoughts on that. And then to follow up, he'll also present the housing analysis um, recommendations, which is going to help us with regard to understanding where we stand overall with our housing stock, high density development. We've received quite a few requests for zone changes and changes to our future land use map. Um, so we put a hold on that, as everybody's aware, and did a moratorium on those type of developments. Uh, the moratorium, moratorium has ended July 2nd. So this housing analysis will recommend certain policies that will help provide some teeth with regard to recommending yes or no on these zone changes. Thank you, Rashad. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, definitely a pleasure to, to stand before you tonight um, and present these two uh, very important items. Um, some of you I, I know very well. Um, some of you uh, I've not had the pleasure of, of meeting yet. And I think it's important yet. to know, David, uh, tell all of us uh, how long you worked for us and then when did you leave us here in the city? So I've, I was the chief city planner for the city um, between 2017 and, and 2020. Um, I timed it perfectly to uh, go to Freeze and Nichols right as the pandemic hit. Um, but I, when, when I, I left, I knew I would get to come back and, and work with the city. Um, I, I live in Grand Prairie. Uh, we've lived here since, uh, since 2015 and grown to love it and become a part of the community. So uh, definitely a, a, has a lot of personal meaning to me to be able to work on this project. Uh, we live down in the, in the 360 corridor. Um, so it's, it's very important to, to me and my family and certainly very important to the city. So thank you, Mayor, for, for allowing me to And David, uh, real quick, to I that. want to introduce behind you Jason Clonch with Catalyst, who does a lot of work for our city and helped uh, David with Freezing Nichols with this analysis. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. So we, we do have a lot of uh, material to present tonight. Um, some of it try to go through fairly quickly. If, if at any point you, you want me or Jason, who's going to be helping me present this tonight, to stop, go back over something, um, particularly at the housing analysis, a lot of very dense uh, numbers-based information, um, we'll be happy to do so. Um, for, the, uh, for the Southgate 360 corridor, and I beg your pardon, I'm going to try to open this in a different, different application so that I'm not scrolling. There we go. So for the Southgate 360 um, corridor plan, uh, we presented this to, to PNZ and to council a couple months ago. Um, of course, since then, we've, we've had uh, the election. So um, for, for those of you who are on board, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to set up the, the parameters of the project, kind of the goals of, of the project. I uh, apologize to, to some of you for you know, if, if this is old hat for you, but we, we want to, you know, make sure that we uh, communicate the, the purpose of, of the plan. Um, as, as Rashad mentioned, this uh, deals with the South 360 corridor, specifically 360 between Raglan Road and uh, the Southern ETJ, um, a portion of which goes almost all the way down to US 67, uh, down in the Midlothian uh, area. Uh, so we have that on the map. Part, part of the area is uh, interrupted by the, the Mansfield city limits. Um, but as, as we look uh, at this area, you know, would, it naturally splits into, into two portions, uh, one of which is, is the northern area, which is much smaller, and then the southern area, which is a, a far larger area um, that encompasses the ETJ. One of the things we, we did, uh, of course, uh, is analyze the undeveloped land. This is one of the, the last large uh, resources of, of undeveloped land within the city, uh, particularly now that uh, 161 corridor is, is starting to fill in um, and, and other areas of the city uh, are starting to get developed. You, you have down particularly in the, the southern study area, but also in the north as well, um, quite a few undeveloped parcels. Uh, particularly in the south, it's, it's almost uh, 12,000 acres uh, that, that have yet to be 
uh, developed. Uh, there are some challenges in that area, you know, particularly when it comes to, to infrastructure. Um, the roadways are, are all you know, bits of, built to, to county uh, maintenance levels, uh, essentially. There are some state corridors down in there, uh, but it's also an area that's developing quickly, and it's surrounded by three cities which are also developing quickly, and uh, Mansfield, Midlothian, and, and Venus. And uh, as, as we heard Brandon say, um, the legislature is always churning as well, and uh, this last session they targeted uh, ETJ, um, you know, basically taking a, a use it or lose it stance. So uh, the decisions that we make here, usually we have a 20 year planning horizon uh, for a plan like this, but this one has a little bit of added urgency, uh, both because of the development pressure um, and also because it's not all completely within your city limits. With apologies to Rashad, uh, you know, this is a small area plan, but, but this is not a small area. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know what else uh, uh, illustrates that better than uh, overlaying the, just the southern study area, that's 21 square miles, um, over the rest of Grand Prairie. So if you put that in central Grand Prairie, it would extend from I-30 um, down almost to Joe Pool Lake. So we're talking about a very large area here um, that in many ways can be compared to a, to a city itself. Um, so please remember that because that will come up again, uh, that we've got a whole city down south of Joe Pool Lake, most of which is undeveloped. So in terms of the, the planning process, um, you know, what, what, is, what is the purpose of, of doing this plan? Um, what we want to do is bring things into alignment, you know, from both the, the public standpoint and the, the private standpoint. Uh, meaning taking the physical opportunities that you have with the undeveloped land in this area, aligning them with the, the market demand that we see. One of the things that Jason's group did was uh, conduct a, a market study um, to analyze uh, what the, the capacity is in this area for different types of development. And then the last thing we want to align is the aspirations of the community. You know, what are your desires for this area? What do you want to see? And then all those things are combined together to form the vision uh, for an area. Uh, to establish a community consensus, uh, to get your support, to get your weight behind it, because if we don't have that, then you know, a plan doesn't go very far without the community behind it, without council behind it. Um, so your buy-in is very important. Um, and then finally, to know that we're not going out there with a whole bunch of dreams and aspirations that the market is just gonna turn its back on, that we've got something that, that can actually be built, actually be done. So I mentioned the, uh, the market assessment. Um, just you know, real briefly, it, it tells us that owner-occupied residential demand is high. It tells us that renter-occupied residential development is high. Um, this is not the housing study. This is just particular to this area. Some of the things that we discuss in this plan will come up again in, in the housing study. We've done our best not to be repetitive there, but some things are, are definitely applicable to both. Um, retail demand is high uh, within the area outlined in red. That's, that's your trade area. Um, some of it bleeds over into other communities, uh, particularly Arlington. Um, if you have any questions kind of about how this, this map wa was drawn, um, we can get into that, but suffice it to say that, that this is the area where if you're building retail on the 360 corridor, if, if you're building um, other commercial uses, that this is where you can expect uh, shoppers to come from, restaurant goers to, to come from. Um, so this, this analysis uh, kind of tells you what the demand is in this area, because if it's not found in this area, these people are leaving to go somewhere else. Um, so that speaks to, to leakage um, and the opportunities uh, in this area. Uh, industrial, moderate demand, and then office is, is a low demand. Uh, if we're talking about, again, what the market will provide on its own in terms of spec office or uh, what they, you know, what office developers are seeing out there in terms of uh, tenants who are interested in, in leasing in this area. So we take all that information, um, we take those numbers that I, I showed on the screen before, um, and we start looking at opportunities uh, specific to 360. So on this map, uh, we, we have um, locations of, of major property owners uh, within the south portion of, of the study area, that south sector. Uh, one of the things we, we did as part of this process was to conduct some interviews with major property owners um, in the area, uh, kind of get their idea of, you know, what, what do you see from the market? What, what are your, um, your goals for this area? What are you interested in developing? 
and then align that with that market analysis so that we start to plug in those numbers and really get a sense of how could this area develop. Where could all that demand for residential go? Where could all the demand for uh, commercial and retail go? Um, so I won't spend too much time uh, you know, going through this slide. This is one of your handouts that you have. So if, we, if you have any questions toward the end of the presentation, we can definitely go back through this. Um, but this is how we divvy up those numbers. If you're wondering, what do we do with those numbers that we just showed on, on the last slide? So kind of like we mentioned a couple of minutes ago, here we have an area of you know, 25 square miles, give or take. Um, it's located almost 20 miles from where we're standing right now. Uh, to put that into context, it's about the same distance as downtown Fort Worth is from Texas Motor Speedway. Um, so you have an area that in, in many respects is, is rather cut off from the rest of the city. Um, so if you're living down there south of Joe Pool Lake, um, something like you know coming in and uh, getting a building permit or coming and paying a traffic ticket you know becomes very hard uh, to kind of make your way the you know m make your way up here the, the 19 miles so the thought is you know we we need some some redundant city services down in this area we need to create a, a new village center essentially a, a city within a city um, and since we have you know, that, that opportunity, that idea, that vision in mind, um, you know, building upon it to create uh, essentially a, a village-like setting, a uh, village-like atmosphere um, where you've got the city as an anchor, um, that the city has made an investment in this area, and that the, the, private, um, the private side of the market builds around that using the city as, as an anchor. Um, the 2010 comprehensive plan uh, showed a, a similar vision for this area. The location was a little bit different than what we're showing on the, uh, on the concept plan that you see on your screen that's also on your handout. Um, but it, it was missing the element of uh, you know, using the city as an anchor, building a city facility that would house um, you know, administrative functions, uh, that would house uh, some, some parks functions, that would potentially have a library. Uh, animal shelter, other similar type uses that folks would have to drive a long distance to, to go to otherwise if they lived in this area and wanted to utilize Grand Prairie facilities. So using that a, as an anchor, um, you know, similar to, to what you see in, in Epic Central with the, the park element, with the, with the pond, just thinking about it on a little bit more urban scale, a little bit more compact scale um, that's, uh, that, that becomes a, a village center, that becomes a city center in this area. Since you know, Epic Central, um, pretty close to downtown, uh, still within the heart of the city. So replicating that that model and, and surrounding it with um, you know, surrounding it with more urban development. Another idea that that kind of came to the surface as we were interviewing property owners, uh, as as we were you know working with the city, there's a lot of stream corridors in this area. So the the map on the the left, um, you'll see there's all those uh, green. Um, corridors where, where you have floodplain, where you have uh, creeks that feed into Joe Pool Lake. Um, these can really serve as, as the foundation of, of the recreation uh, and even transportation network. And, and when I say that, um, the idea is you know, building on that village center concept where you, you have uses that are in close proximity to each other, um, anchored by the city. Uh, that folks can get out and walk, that folks can get out and bike, that they can utilize those, those stream corridors, you know, not just for recreation, but to get from one uh, side of this area to another on a bike or on foot uh, or by jogging. Uh, there's a great opportunity down there to do that because, uh, again, most of this is undeveloped. Um, and those corridors, uh, in many cases, which won't be developed, um, are great opportunities to, uh, to build out that trail network, to build out that, that parks network with minimal acquisition costs from, from the city. Um, you can ask for, ask for developers to, um, to provide that as they develop. North Sector, uh, similar concept, but, but there you've, uh, you've got much better adjacency to Lloyd Park, much better adjacency to, to Joe Pool Lake. Um, there are some existing trails that are being built in, in Arlington that are, and Mansfield that are stubbing out to 360 that can provide connections for members of the, those communities to, to come in and, and utilize uh, Grand Prairie facilities, um, potentially even a connection up to the, the Lynn Park Marina and, and Lake Ridge Parkway. Um, the, the vision there really being, you know, you've got great frontage on 360, uh, but with the lake behind it, it becomes difficult to, 
you know, to get the, the numbers, the population numbers and the, the trip counts that are needed to do big box retail there. So what if rather than using the lake as, as an inhibitor to that, um, it kind of gets flipped around to where the lake and the park or the front door and what happens on those sites really plays off of, uh, off of those elements uh, to be more of a recreation focused uh, area. So let's talk, um, talk for a couple minutes uh, again about uh, the public side of, of the uh, investment equation uh, in this area, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the private side. Um, obviously, a huge driver uh, of this area, uh, particularly south, is going to be 360, both the expansion north of 287, going from, from four lanes to eight lanes um, in, in the near future, um, and what happens south of 287. Um, so getting back to the, to the concept of a village center um, that's, that's a more walkable, more urban, more mixed use, um, the character of 360 as it's extended down from, from 287, and, and again, TxDOT doesn't have plans at this time to, they, they don't have an alignment for, for 360, they don't have plans to extend it south of 287. Um, so now is the opportune time to uh, go to TxDOT and, and say, hey, this is our preferred alignment. How 360 gets built out is going to be very important to the character of this area. Um, so the, the natural presumption might be, well, it's going to be a freeway just like it is north of 287. Um, the, the idea of doing it as a, as a landscape parkway, uh, a landscape boulevard, you know, came up during our, our discussions with stakeholders in, in the city as, as a way to mark a transition into this area and really um, give it the character of, of a more um, urban area, a more unique area compared to the to this north of 287. And that can be scaled down, you know, from, from 360, which is a state highway, um, down to the to the urban local uh, section as well, to give it, the, to give this area, you know, really a uniform look, a uniform feel that's heavily landscaped, uh, that's again, very, very urban and uh, has a very good sense of design. Um, how you design the streets, you know, goes a long way toward that. We want to blend that into what the what the private sector is doing, but this is really kind of uh, along with the, the stream corridors, you know, amenitizing those, building trails in those, uh, is really kind of the the first steps um, to to take uh, to establishing the character of this area. Um, I mentioned before, you know, the the idea of a of a city facility uh, where you've got several city functions um, that take place within. Um, within a city facility, uh, that too can be used as, as uh, an enhancement to, to the area to establish the character to be a landmark. Um, you know, this is one example of the, the photo in, in the center where you have a, a clock tower um, that, that stands out from, you know, a few miles around uh, that, that can be seen. Um, supplementing that with, uh, with signage, with, with landmarks uh, to increase visibility and, and character. There's a couple of different places those can go, but you know, one, one thing we, we tried to keep in mind with uh, this plan, particularly along 287, um, you know, those, those corners, uh, 287 and 360 in particular, still going to be very strong retail corners uh, because of the visibility and the trip. So, you know, we want to do something there that's going to stand out, um, that's going to capture people's attention um, as they're exiting off of, off of 287. Um, so some ideas for, for locations of, of where those things could go, the city facility in the, the center of the um, the urban village, um, but then having some, some signage as you're coming in to, uh, to this area from 287 or even from, uh, from 360 uh, down to the south there from, from Midlothian um, really kind of announces that, hey, this is the South Gate area, um, this is Grand Prairie, uh, because otherwise, you know, it, it kind of blends into to the rest of the environment. So we definitely want to mark this as a, as a distinctly uh, unique area. Grand Prairie um, has 30% floodplain, uh, essentially, which, which means that there's a lot of bridges in the city. Um, but when it comes to great landmark bridges, uh, you know, we, we think there's, a, there's an opportunity to do something here, because you do have a major crossing that will have to occur um, in 360 um, going over Soap Creek. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to, to do something in terms of a, of a landmark bridge that, again, really uh, announces uh, this area um, as being uh, Grand Prairie, as being Southgate. Um, so the, uh, again, there's a couple of opportunities uh, in, in this area where, where we can implement. 
uh, something like that. Uh, we'll go over uh, funding and uh, funding mechanisms in a moment because, of course, this is uh, you know something we'll have to work with TxDOT on, um, identify funding, uh, but uh, is kind of one of those uh, bang for your buck items uh, that can be seen from 360, that can be seen from 287 and, and 67. Um, that, that really uh, draws people into this area and kind of announces this as, as the gateway into Grand Prairie. So that's the, that's the public side of the equation, you know, getting into the, into the private side, you know, how that, how that develops becomes really important, what you surround that city facility with and, and that how you build out that, that urban village center, you know, with, with appropriately um, dense uh, retail and, and residential um, and, and make sure you know there's a there's a concentration of population uh, in in that area to, to really make this a, a special area. So, doing things at a at a again a, a walkable scale, um, a scale where people can can get out and you know they're not having to compete with with too much auto traffic or you know walk across large parking lots. Um, an area where where people can um, can can live and, and shop. Um, you know, essentially making it making it another another city center. Up at 360 and, and 287, um, you know, if the city is the anchor to to the south of 287, uh, what do we anchor north of 287? Um, again, we we saw that the that the office development or the office uh, demand in, in this area is low, uh, just like it is practically anywhere you go south of I-30. Uh, you know, office development in DFW is low. It all pushes north, so. It becomes important in this area uh, to identify places where um, you know, the city can, can work with office developers to identify uh, corporate users or identify tenants who are interested in, in being in this area where there's a lot of housing that's being built um, that's catering to um, you know, more executive uh, level um, residents who are now having to drive up to Las Colinas or drive to, to Fort Worth or drive to Dallas. So bringing those jobs here in, into this sector um, is part of the equation. Um, identifying areas where, where those users can go is, is the other part. So 287 and, and 360 presents, a, a, again, a great opportunity to do that along with the, the retail uses. Um, and you know, essentially building something that, that isn't seen on, on this side of the Metroplex. I mean, there's a great opportunity here um, to, to set this area apart as being unique on the, the south side of the Metroplex, as, as being an area with, uh, with an urban district, as being an area with shopping, uh, with dining, um, with office users, you know, kind of all concentrated in, in, in the same area. Um, some areas uh, on the south side of DFW have some of those ingredients, but, uh, but this, one, uh, this one would really have all of those ingredients. Another element, and of course we're going to speak plenty about housing tonight, but just real quickly making sure there's high quality housing in this area. Uh, again, particularly uh, highlighting um, you know, that connection to, to greenways as we spoke about before. It's a great opportunity to use those networks as, uh, as an amenity and, and also part of your transportation network, so getting people as close to those as possible. Uh, making sure there's a good mix of, of owner occupied along with the, the renter demand that we saw. Also a great opportunity at, at you know, at the, the single, detached single family um, end of the spectrum of, of housing um, to do more exclusive uh, gated type uh, enclave uh, residential. Uh, with all of these stream corridors, you, you get a lot of peninsulas where these corridors uh, come together. So the, this presents a, a natural location for um, gated communities that don't have three streets that the city will be maintaining um, and, you know, they're buffered on, on two sides by, by green space that, that won't be developed. So identifying those and kind of reserving those for that higher end um, uh, type, uh, type development um, presents a great opportunity. Making sure that, that the housing itself is, is diverse, both in the, the north and south side of the sector, um, that we really uh, make sure that, that there's true life cycle housing, that, that somebody can grow up here, work here, uh, rent, then buy a home, uh, and age in place w within this community, making it a true community, again, anchored by the investment um, of the city um, and, and by the, the amenities that you have down there in terms of the parks and, and, the, and the lake, you know, making it so that nobody would, would want to live anywhere else, you know, essentially making this uh, one of the premier areas of, of Grand Prairie. Housing is a, a huge element of that. Um, you know, it reflects where people, people are at in life, so um, 
you know, the, the goal would be that, you know, what, whatever housing that, that you're seeking would, would be found in, in this area. So of course we'll we'll get into housing a little bit more later, but um, but you know that's that's a that's a key key driver and, and key to determinant of the success in this area. Um, as far as non-residential design, uh, we just spoke about building materials and you know the city's ability or, or lack thereof to regulate building materials. You know one of the things that, that we're seeing as we're coming out of the out of the pandemic um, is that the the types of businesses that are thriving in, in terms of uh, restaurants, in terms of shopping, are, are ones that offer experiences uh, that offer unique opportunities. Um, to be in a, in a cool area or, or to do something that, you know, you're combining with, with eating, chicken and pickle being a, a great example uh, where you're getting outdoors and, and you're playing games and, um, you know, you're next to a, next to a water feature. Uh, that really lends itself to attracting multiple generations of, of people um, and creating a great district over time. So getting back to the building materials thing, um, you know, that's traditionally been one of the elements of quality of, of, a, of a commercial building. Now we're kind of having to, to pivot a little bit more and think about what are the other unique aspects of, of successful businesses, um, you know, beyond just the facade on the door and the, the name on the sign. Um, you know, it's, it's outdoor space, it's flexibility, um, it's, it's live music, it's rooftop dining, um, food halls. Uh, so making sure we build in that flexibility and build in those experiences is, is going to be just as crucial to the, to the design and function of, of this area as, as the building materials or, or the colors. You know, you can, you can easily over-design things and stray into kind of a Disney World um, look. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's what we want to avoid here um, is making sure that it's authentic and that it's grown over time and that people are making experiences there over time. So this is on your handout, just kind of summing up the, the corridor recommendations, and, and these are these really blend into both the, the north and south um, sectors of, of 360. Um, so again, just to kind of kind of sum up, using the uh, the trail system as a as a foundation uh, for the area. Grand Prairie is known for its parks. It's known for its recreation. Um, that same thing should be true down in the in the South 360 area, but even more so because you have so many great recreational opportunities. Um, that sets the tone. Um, again, incorporating diverse housing types um, to meet that demand that we see all over North Texas um, and to attract as many residents as possible um, to this area. Um, creating a new city center south of, of Joe Pool Lake where the city make, makes an, an investment uh, in, in this area and at the same time fulfills a need that we'll, um, that, that we'll have when you know, the next 20, 30,000 uh, potentially residents you know, move down toward this area. Um, using 360 and 287 as your, your retail anchors, your, your office anchors. Uh, preserving land for for those target industries, you know, whether it's an office user, it's an advanced manufacturing user, uh, making sure that the that those crucial pieces of land are are preserved, um, and that that you're working to to find those businesses and that you're able to to offer them you know, what they need. Making sure that it's a uh, destination oriented, um, that you know we're focusing not just on the building envelope but also the the experiences and and the environment. Um, and then finally, those signature elements that we talked about, you know, design, uh, bridges, uh, public realm, uh, enhancements, signage. You know, all that, all that comes together to, you know, mark this as a, as a special area, a special opportunity. Um, so in that vein, you know, that, that's, all, that's all great to talk about in terms of city um, investments. But, of course, it, it has to be paid for somehow. And, of course, we're trying to hit a moving target here in, in some respects with, uh, with the, the state, you know, continually um, kind of throwing us in doubt as, as far as what our tools will have, but um, creating a tax uh, increment financing district uh, in, in the area, um, you know, conversations that, uh, that, that have occurred in, in the past, but, um, you know, continuing to work with, uh, uh, with the other stakeholders down in the area, particularly the county. Um, this area does straddle a county line between Ellis and Johnson County. Those are both fast-growing counties who will need their own remote facilities, um, given that this is at the edge of both of those counties, so uh, potential partners um, in, in that. Um, as far as parks, uh, again, one of the, the great advantages of having so many natural opportunities uh, for recreation is, is that 
Um, you know, you're not asking developers to carve out little pieces of, of their subdivision. I mean, that there will still be a need for that, um, but instead you, you can focus on um, things like uh, park fee and lieu mechanisms, uh, partnering with, uh, with developers to develop parks, um, or potentially impact fees. And those are strategies that, um, that can be implemented in this area. Jason, uh, we'll, uh, we'll kind of run through this, these next couple of slides uh, real quickly uh, to go over fiscal impact. Thank you, David. Um, I hope I can apologize for being uh, brief. I, I don't think you'll miss the brevity tonight, but um, there are a lot of financial implications. One of the things that we wanted to do is really evaluate uh, the takeoffs from a lot of the recommendations and the programs. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of recommendations to, to some of the changes in the land use. Um, we took that information, essentially applied uh, economic model, uh, both in the north area and the south area, just to get an idea of sort of the economic baseline. Um, we also, in both scenarios, we, we reverse the cost of service, recognizing that as you add corporate or add residential, uh, there's a level of service that you have to provide, so we wanted to accommodate that uh, as well. Um, essentially, both in the 10-year summary and the 20-year summary, both are accretive uh, to the city budget. Uh, so this will help you build capacity to help fund some of the infrastructure that's going to be needed in the area. And again, David talked about some of the tools that we could use to essentially do some value capture um, through that process. Um, uh, in the north area, that area is uh, fairly small in geography. Uh, about the 10-year mark, we're going to hit build out, so there's not a lot of difference in terms of population and employment. Uh, after the 10-year mark, but it is, uh, again, cumulative, so uh, that base continues to grow. Uh, again, same process in the south area. South area is a little bit different. We have a little bit longer runway, so we've got more capacity for growth. Um, uh, that essentially gives you a little bit more cumulative revenue. Again, more infrastructure is going to be needed in that area, uh, so ultimately the, the, uh, the incremental uh, benefit is going to be a lot greater over a little bit longer period of time because we still have uh, new employment and new population growth occurring after that 10-year mark. Um, but again, uh, both scenarios uh, in the 10-year mark uh, creates uh, a little over 19 million in net revenue uh, and 92 million in the 20-year revenue. So again, a lot of capacity for the city um, to support some of the uh, essentially civic services and public infrastructure needed to service and demand some of this growth. So I'll put this slide back, back up here again. The, it's also in, in your handout. But um, we want to open it up now to, uh, to any discussion or, or questions that, that you have um, on, on, the, on the plan. While we're thinking, Steve, you've got some comments, then Council, y'all can be. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, great job, David and Jason, and I appreciate all the staff members who worked on this. What we tried to lay out for you tonight is a, a vision, a starting point for Southgate. Uh, this is something to generate conversation and thoughts. Moving forward, we want your input on what you liked about the initial vision, what you don't like about it. Uh, we would love to hear back from you. And then I also wanted to mention we're also underway because a lot of that land down there, as mentioned, is in the ETJ. We're doing an analysis of a feasibility study of looking at annexing that. As uh, Brandon mentioned earlier, that's a much tougher process than it used to be. However, we're going to do a feasibility analysis and we'll, Mayor, we'll bring that uh, back to you all uh, as well for consideration, just to see what our options are, because that's certainly a, bit, a big part of this potential vision. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Kurt? Uh, just a comment for the council to make sure we are thinking on the same page here. Uh, with the develop I think it's a great idea to have the development down there. Uh, I think it used the tax revenues. Uh, Developing that along with the other things we're discussing down there, how would that impact the residents who don't know what might be coming down there? And we're making that, we're doing a development. They move in and they realize, hey, I don't want to be this close to X, Y, Z. So if, what impact studies have we done towards that? Well, Council Member Johnson, one of the things that we've done and the reason, one of the major reasons for this study is to look at that. The folks that would be moving down into that area or what have you, we've branded it as Southgate. And by branding it, we want to have a master plan, and that's what this represents in a lot of ways. So anyone who would be wanting to go out in that area and develop or what have you, they would have access to a master plan that would let them know what was going to be going on around them. So you would always be fully aware 
of what kind of developments would be coming in and we'd be working very diligently with developers as well as anyone else to look at that area and trying to design and follow the plan that we, we have asked Freezing Nichols to come up with for us to and for you to consider and for us to consider and for us to enact. That's the whole key, okay. is you have to have a plan of action in order to be effective in your development strategies. And this plan of action is one that we truly believe is one that can work for us and not only work for us, but work for you as our city council and guiding us through the next 10 to 15 to 20 years of development down through the southern area. Okay. Thank you, Bill. John? Did you have more? Yeah, I had another one. Oh, sorry, Kurt. Uh, looking at just trying to look into the future, I know you guys look into the future as far as uh, office space with the most since the pandemic majority of folks are going to max telework so i know we have a low in uh, impact as far as bringing office space here it's not a big thing but uh how do we manage that as far as looking forward you just say you're looking at eighteen thousand square feet of office space but i know at my corporation we have a ton everyone's going to max telework so we're going from 15 floors down to six floors so i'm just wondering how does it before we develop that, uh, when does office space going to, and along with that is the shopping, everything is going online shopping now and we're looking for retail space. I know restaurants would be a great idea, but when you, uh, I was going to say, someone said it, I think you might've said it. Oh, don't <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Megan said it in another <laughs> meeting about what we don't Please. want in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what we don't want in there as a retail opportunity so those are two questions i had uh shopping since everyone's doing online shopping and i think that's that's really the feature and then the retail spent me the uh, office space that everyone's going to max telework yeah right, great questions i'll say uh, to answer your first question we did an exhaustive amount of individual one-on-one -on -one interviews with a lot of these property owners so a lot of the at least <laughs> thinking and ideas is calibrating some of the the, the thinking and planning that they're already doing and uh Part of the challenge is, is, is uh, infrastructure and alignment of roads needs to be coordinated, and so I think this process helps do that. But um, I, I don't think there'll be any surprises in terms of the amount of development, pent up development activity uh, that, that's desired. Um, as it relates to, to retail, uh, obviously that, that market's been evolving for a number of years. The places I grew up shopping at are different than where I go today, and I think you guys are responding with places like the Epic uh, that, that have that active engagement. Uh, and the mixes of uses I think is smart and I think that's where the market is going and those places that are master plan and integrated with mixed use are doing very very well uh, sort of the places that don't have those elements are struggling and, and you have some of those places we'll talk a little bit about commercial quality and the holistic study uh, soon but um, the office market is re recovering uh, we're still importing a lot of jobs and a lot of talent you have a lot of talent in this area we want to take advantage of, of that where we can in a corporate environment uh, but I think the office environment will certainly be designed and, and changed differently, and uh, we certainly want to accommodate uh, how that evolves over time as well. John? No. David, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, a couple of questions, and if we start getting too much into the housing, then we can just wait to the housing section and talk about that. But that's really the, the primary focus of my questions is the housing, but in your study that you mentioned in your report here, um, the RCLCO study on page 77 of your report, was that a national-wide study, a Texas study, or? Is a yeah, Texas study? RCLCO um, does housing studies nationally, so that was part of their work. Uh, <coughs> was referenced nationally. We used a lot of local uh, residential projects as analogs because I think that's more applicable to your market but but they are a national firm okay because I know right here you talk about rent, renters earning over a hundred thousand in this project is that the target that we're trying to shoot for is people that make a hundred thousand plus to live in this area no not necessarily that that's a that's a, a measurement of you know when, when it comes to, to what rent um, someone living in this area could, could qualify for um, it, it looks at what what the different um, income categories uh, could qualify for in, in terms of in terms of rent that's 
you know, that's not to say that, that we're targeting these to the exclusion of, of anyone else. Um, it's, it's just information uh, that, you know, that in, informs us as to how to align housing with, uh, with the folks who are living in this area. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about uh, affordability and income ranges in the housing study because I think you'll find that there's distinct differences uh, across the board in terms of affordability. I know um, by doing the regional study that the affordability is certainly higher in the southern sector because there's higher incomes yeah. uh, based on the amenity, but that's not necessarily true uh, citywide. Okay. I'm, uh, yeah, I was ju just trying to connect, especially when you talk about retail and grocery stores. You know, there's a lot of working families that, you know, I guess we don't want to kind of try and figure out we invest in this. I mean, so they'd be working and, and playing in that area. They won't have the option to live in that area. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to rule people out and make sure that we focus on, make sure there is a true diversity regarding income levels that live down south in this area as well. Whether it be low housing tax credits from the state or whatever, but we have to incorporate those type of initiatives to really be an inclusive part of the process. I, I think when you see the holistic plan and we represent the remainder of the housing study in kind of part B, uh, that you'll find there, there's a lot of equity that was integrated in, into the thinking and, and into some of the policies uh, because there is a broad range of, of uh, incomes and, and diversity within the city that was addressed. Yeah. And then representing District 4, which is mostly south of I-20, a lot of people that live in my district along Lake Ridge Parkway, they've been asking for city services, better city services. Mm -hmm. They've been asking for a community rec center to be built south of 20, there's none. They've been asking for a library to be built south of 20. So if we're talking about doing a city within the city, we're, we're really looking at those type of things that residents are asking for today mm -hmm. to try to check people in the future. And I think that we, we really have to figure out that part of it because we can't leave people out of the process and we can't just think about future residents to live in a certain part of town. I mean, there's residents today that want those type of city services that exist today. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, that was, I mean, all these questions are regarding housing. So once we get to that, then we, Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that that's definitely a big emphasis of the, the housing portion is making sure we're not building too much housing in areas that, that don't have existing services before those services are in place. And uh, Mr. Johnson, just to uh, address your question about the residents who are living down there now, um, we definitely didn't want to, to overlook them. Um, so we were very careful and, you know, allocating the, the land uses on, on the map uh, to make sure that we weren't taking an existing neighborhood and saying, oh, this is going to be commercial. Um, the residences that are down there now are almost, without exception, shown as, as residential um, you know, in, in the future. Yeah, what, my question was really geared to what we know that may be developed down there. The residents don't know, and the future residents don't know, but Bill said on the master plan, they have an opportunity to go look at, hey, before I move here, mm -hmm. hopefully they would have the, because some people might not want to be around that because, because it's the traffic. Right. And that's one reason I moved to Grand Prairie off Carrier because I was going to move to Arlington off Cooper in 99, but I went there one evening and realized that's just too much traffic. So I moved down to Carrier. Good thing I- go Now you're fixing to move to Middle Othium. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> So, uh, carrier, I hear at around eight o'clock in the morning. It's busy. I get in at six. I get home, I get off at two thirty, so I miss all of that. So, uh, I'm just concerned about the traffic and the impact, and having uh, enough infrastructure to incorporate all of that, so everyone can have a freeway in and freeway out. Because we're gonna, there's gonna. I, I just believe everything's gonna be grand in Grand Prairie. So. Councilmember Clemson. Thank you, Mayor and David. I just want to, uh, you to clarify something for me. On the additional population projection for north and south, I think you had that on one of the slides, and that's around mm -hmm. 8,000 in 20 years. That is that correct? 
So th this is th this is looking at in 20 years, you know, 8,000 new residents are projected. Because it's such a large area, the projection actually would realistically go out much further than that. This is looking at the the demand um, from the from the market analysis and how many lots could realistically be built um, within within a given year. So, so the the ultimate capacity of that area is, is going to be much larger than that. That's what I figured, 20 year. acres I, yeah. yes. to build that probably would be 30, 40,000? Probably more than that. Yes. Yeah, we, we kept at least the current demand constant and yeah, apply that going yeah. forward for, for at least build out financial purposes for planning purposes and, and using this as a fiscal tool, we want to be conservative, but, but obviously with that much acreage and as much density as planned, mm -hmm. you know, long term, you could far exceed these numbers, and as you start to accommodate an appetite that would accommodate higher density, uh, we'll show in some projections that, that essentially, uh, and obviously this area would absorb the majority of your build out uh, in the future, that this area could, could absorb a substantial amount of population um, in the long run, for sure. And I believe we've had a figure that we've talked about as far as our build out currently. And I don't remember what that is. About but 270 or something around like that. Around 270. Um, so this would be a, an additional 30 to 40,000 people to that 270. Or, or possibly even more over time. Or yes. possibly. I think one of the charts that I show, you know, depending on what metric you use, could be 270 or even above 300, um, depending on, you know, again, density and. In, uh, in policy, so this this area could be substantial depending on how you want to see it roll out. Thank you. I Good just question. didn't exactly know how the eight thousand. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's the not the that's not the total. No. <laughs> and that may not be twenty years from now because it depends on how long we take to do anything. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilmember Dabowski. Thank you, sir. So to parlay off of what Councilman Johnson uh, had asked about as far as the community, what uh, Bill, what you said as far as the master plan, one thing that I've experienced and that um, being a big planner is as the master plan is being created, what we've experienced, especially in District 3 with the last um, uh, project that was approved for the hybrid housing, but even going before that where we had apartments and the whole neighborhood comes out and there's 300 names of against it what are we doing or what are we starting to plan pre-discussions of how to be proactive instead of us when i've learned how we had to be reactive in that um what are we what what discussions are we creating to avoid that because in my district second oldest district you know those houses you know they're 200,000 at at the very very on a good day where you look at Mira Largo's peninsula, everything that's being uh, uh, built south of 287, you know, those are more expensive houses. And are they gonna want apartments or hybrid or whatever we're gonna design with the final is, you know, what are we gonna be going to them as a city to say, hey, look, here's our urban living, but are they, how are we going to um, not have those discussions, those negative discussions or come down on Councils, uh, Councilman Lopez or Johnson here of, hey, we don't want that here. You know, have we started, uh, have we thought about it, wrote down ideas, uh, what direction are we going to go on that? That way we can be ready for that discussion. Is that in part of our master plan or is it some of the staff bill that we're starting to work on? Steve? Yeah, uh, great, great question and comment. That's exactly why we're starting this now. This is the very first stage, if you will, this will be years in the making. As the mayor mentioned, it could be 10 years or 30 years. I think the key to, to trying to avoid what you experienced is having a comprehensive master plan, the policy from council on this is what we would like to see, and then making that transparent to future uh, residents and business owners so they know, hey, here's what it's zoned for, here's, here's the vision. Uh, and I think if we can do that up front in a more organized manner, we can maybe avoid those situations that you found yourself in so yeah. again this is just the first step this is to generate discussion and input and then we will tweak this according to your yeah, direction but yeah mike i think that this will actually help us prevent those scenarios town hall meetings Ooh. 
Yeah, and and you know the, the yeah with the master plan. Let me remind everybody. We want fixing a thing to sign up there. No, no, no. But if this happens, uh, if this is a long way out there, right? Let's just leave it at that. Let's just and say it's ten years out. Having a master plan, yeah. Uh, having a master plan helps. I like what Bill said to your answer, Kurt. It helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Let me take a stab at it. I've been listening to these cases for more years than I want to count. I don't care what you do, there's going to be some people sitting here 10 years from now that are going to say, my favorite was one night when they said, I like looking at the cows. I want to keep looking at the cows. And, yeah. you know, I understand that. You know, I, I moved to a house that had horses next to me. And my granddaughter fell in love, but I told her, I said, look, that's going to develop. Those horses are going to go away. So I don't care what we do, you're going to have some people down here in the future. But I, I will say, I think Steve nailed it. This master plan is the best thing, whether it's this or however you plan it. That's the best thing you can do so at least you can tell people in the future, look, we, we tried to follow a plan, okay? And people have access to that. They can go on the internet, they can look at it. So most won't, to be honest. Right. Uh, most won't check the zoning next to them. Uh, I mean, I, the war stories, I mean, the city Steve came from, Colleyville, uh, and I was in Euless. We built this thoroughfare called Mid Cities through the city, desperately needed to get out to the airport. It got to the mm -hmm. city limits line between Colleyville and, and uh, Bedford. And I guess the people thought they bought their house next to a linear park because they said, you know, the, the right of way was left to bring that road. To this day, it's still not built. You know, they kept it a two lane. So mm -hmm. the best thing you can do, do your master plans, publish it, advertise it. Get the word out there and at least try to educate the people. Hey, folks, you, if you're one of the early people moving out there, you may feel like you're in the country, but you're going to be in the downtown area. I mean, it's land's going to develop. I, yeah. I mean, it's inevitable. You you have to remember this as, is going to sell out there. as council <laughs> members, you've got first obligation to the citizens, but you've also got landowners that you have that have a right to. So find what's best for everybody. That's uh, This is kind of a nice new city. Yeah. It, it really will be a new city. They won't even think they're part of Grand Prairie. Right. They won't. They don't now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, John. I guess another big factor of this is electricity. I mean, right now we get a lot of inquiries saying all the growth that we're doing within our city is impacting our electrical grid and, and, and and do all these power outages. I know part of your plan is also to try to work with Encore and you know those type of entities to make sure that there's enough power to to be part of this plan as well, and not pretty much build it and then worry about the power. But that's that needs to be in the forefront as well. Mm -hmm. y yes, sir. Absolutely, infrastructure, Mr. Lopez, actually, ac uh, absolutely at the forefront of our thinking because. You'll see in that ETJ feasibility study, a big component of that is the needed infrastructure and can we afford it? Yes, sir. And unfortunately, we don't have to figure in the electrical afford. Encore is tasked with that. They stay abreast of all these things. Atmos, I'm more worried about than Encore, but that is a concern. And they stay ahead of, uh, try to stay ahead. Fortunately, they're bringing in a south loop to Marilago, so we won't get cut off like we did this past deal. But, uh, the whole state of Texas, uh, Governor Abbott and everybody feels like we're going to continue this growth pattern, not just the DFW area, the whole state of Texas. So Encore is already on notice of how many people are moving in here every year, how many businesses, and uh, this will just be a small part of that overall growth in the whole state of Texas. It, it's, it's a major <coughs> undertaking, Tom, John, just to keep up with the prior grid in the state of Texas. But our state has already decided we're open for business. And uh, so we're going to continue growing. Dallas Fort Worth is going to continue to grow. This really is going to be a whole new city. <clears throat> Don't know when. 
I love that we're even looking at it. Uh, how much of this overall plan is, is any of it, you, you said it, maybe it went over my head, how much of it is in the ETJ? On a percentage basis, I mean, it's, it's the majority of, of the I southern thought. section. Of the 21 yeah. acres, most of it's in the ETJ. Most of it is, yeah. So Probably we about can't 30% do anything is in the city. We limits. make the decision to, to annex the ETJ. Yeah. I'm not saying that's the first step, but it sure is pretty darn close to the first step. Yes. Now, the reason, for those of you who don't know, the reason we did that back in 1990, 2000, 2000. We did that because the rules changed January 1st on annexation. So the council at that time did a midnight run, just like Arlington did, to annex some stuff out there before the rules changed on the annexation. You're telling me that, the, and uh, we just heard that the rules change now on when we can annex, but I still think we're under not a tight line on the ET, inside the ETJ, correct? Or are we on, on a time? Is there a timing element on us annexing the ETJ? Today, I, I don't believe there is. I don't think there is either. That We're could change, no, though. See, anything new, you have. there is a time of it. So uh, this is great information. What it basically tells us is we're going to have a, something the size of Barilagos and Grand Peninsula. How big is the, those two developments? They're smaller than this. I know. They're yeah. small. So we're going to have four times that and, further and south. A, Mayor, an important point, one reason we're also looking at it now, it's a lot of acreage, but it's pretty sparsely populated. We need and, to do that now. And there, there's it, people out there in the county doing things now. We're still we're communicating with Mansfield. We're partnering with them. We want to try to control our own destiny if we possibly can. Yeah. And, uh, and and you still have large landowners in this area in the ETJ as well, which makes it easier to and work. They're with wanting them. to sell one these days, mm -hmm. because if you've been out there, it ain't worth much for anything else. If you've been. <laughs> <Burn>. <laughs> okay, the TERS, the tax minimum. Is there legislative? Time limits on we is that or is our ability to do that fixing to go away? Not, not as we see, right? No, not as we see. Not, not. It wasn't going away when we did it. They were taking the school's ability Out. to participate without penalty, right? Which gutted us. It's so gutted. we got it done prior to that, right? So good. Thanks. So. <laughs> See, I won't have to be doing this with you. No, he would have that squared away in the corner. He'll, he'll have it all. <laughs> yes, sir. 90 degree, 90 degree. Absolutely. Here, play with your wappy. Thank you, Mayor. You, you only have a few more weeks left, so you just play away. But don't give him a, a damn ballpoint pen that has a clicker on it. I have to take those away from you. So this is a great overview. We're under no timeline to do anything. We can do something tomorrow if we want, but we're under no timeline. There's something we can chew on. It doesn't even matter if we like their plan. Here's the point. We've got 21 acres down there we can do something with. Now, quite frankly, I like this plan because it's a whole new city. <laughs> People would love to move into a development like that. And whether or not We'll have to build some city services, but I also know we need to do some more city services around town before we do that. But it's not like those are mutually exclusive. We can do both. And so this is a great overview. We've needed it. Uh, I'm kind of shocked at how big it is. Rashad. Mayor, just to follow up with what you're saying, this is a guideline for developers and staff to relay what we would like to see developed out there. Yes, it's in the ETJ, but having it designated allows us to say this is what city council and even the property owners, we interviewed the property owners specifically and they, they put their two cents in on what 
their property will be designated in, understanding that this is not zoning. Um, so to that point, if we move forward, we know what type of infrastructure will be needed, and that's where the future uh, annexation analysis comes in. We understand what the cost might, might be, and we can relate cost it. a lot. Yes, yes, and see if it's even justified. Um, I will note, you know, we're doing these, this workshop special session here, but this is test, this is an ordinance. So it has to go to PNZ. It's scheduled to go to PNZ July 26th for their recommendation, and it'll go to council for final adoption on August 17th. Okay. Barring anything that happens at PNZ. Thanks. R Rashad, Rashad, if, if council, if this goes before council in August, if they so choose to hear it then, and it's approved uh, and, and codified in an ordinance, they can still make changes within that ordinance, correct? I want to make sure they understand they still have flexibility. Yes, this okay. is this is just like any other future land use map. It's a big overview. Yes, yes we sir. are amending the 2018 the overall. This is an amendment. Yes, so you can always come back. We got a special developer coming in. We want to make an amendment or you know case by case, we can amend this. And a lot of these things are developer driven. Yes, we can we can want a Lowe's there all day long, but if the developer doesn't want to come do that and wants to keep buying them from home, you know. Yes. But I tell you, I think we'd all agree, it doesn't matter what type of housing you built out there, doesn't matter what kind, they'll sell. Yes. Because people are moving in here, they're moving here fast. Loop 9, if y'all kept up with it, Loop 9's fixing to come over through Ellis County, end up right there at 287. Google it, Loop 9's coming, folks. It's going to end up right there at 287 and 360. Uh, Council Member Delboski. So once it comes to Council in August, what is the timeline uh, that CCDC gets to get involved in? Well, unless we're asked to go back to CCDC, it was reviewed by CCDC. Right. Um, and then we had the PNZ workshop, Council workshop. Now we're doing this special session, so there, there wasn't a plan to go back to CCDC. It was going to go until things start happening. I guess well, then it would be when we decide to do something. We got to annex it first, right? Uh, Council Member Dabowski, this is the first. Uh, just to give you the broader scope of this, this is the first piece of multiple pieces that Freeze and Nichols is doing for us. We just started south, and we'll be moving north through the entire city. We're doing it in portions and pieces. Okay. That's why we brought it to the CCDC for the South for the Southgate sector. Next we'll go from Raglan to probably about twenty. Raglan to about twentieth. Then we'll go further. And so each piece will be adopted in its it itself. Yes. So each piece will come before CCDC. Each piece will be coming before CCDC. Okay. Just like this came before CCDC, each piece will come before CCDC. Then it will be presented to you again. Then it will be presented to the PNZ and Council for Adoption. And each sector, all the way through the entire city, will be done. And it's going to take us about a year to get it all done. But we want to have a comprehensive land use map for the entire city that will guide not only development in the south, but development all the way into the far north and the things that we can envision and bring vision to our desires as well as vision to the desires of developers that will come to us in order to determine what is the best growth pattern for our city. Just like what we discussed in our last CC. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> these first two segments are the more, more of the clean slate segments. Correct. Right. Yeah. Tom. Yeah, just a, a warning I want to uh, leave y'all yeah, with. Georgia. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh. Okay, I, I just, just a warning that I want to leave you with that uh, and I wish I could leave you with the answer, but uh, the developers are going to come in on some of this property in the uh, ETJ. And they're going to talk to you about developing it and bringing it into the city. But what, we were, what we've seen is that some of the developers want to do a somewhat of a new development process that's being done in a lot of places. It's just not my favorite. 
and that is, you know, the way it's worked typically here, developer A goes out, buys some property, developer A develops it, puts the roads, utilities, and all that in, and then he goes, sells lots, gets his money back for that. People come buy a house, when they buy the house, they buy the lot, when they buy the lot, that pays that infrastructure cost, and they pay for it over the next 30 years. That's the traditional way. But what we're seeing now is developers are gonna come in here and they're gonna say, guys, we, we would let you annex this, but here's what we wanna do. We wanna do a freshwater district or a mud or one of these ways that they can raise bond money up front is that what Trophy Club did? They uh, yeah, they did a mud. But a better example would be Viridian, Viridian. Where those people in Viridian are paying a... So what the developer's doing is getting the city to work with them to issue those bonds. They raise that money, and then the city puts a tax rate, or the district and, puts and a that's, tax rate. That's good to mention that, because last I checked, if you're living in Viridian, Cheryl, you pay another 70 cents or 40 something cents? Uh, I don't remember what the tax rate is, but it's, yes. It's high. Yes. More than, you pay more to the, you pay more to Viridian than you do the city. That's correct. Yes, sir. Make sure you understand that. Our tax rate is 6900 Arlington's is less than ours. But if we were to do something like a Viridian, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, that's a probably a good plan. You'd be paying double. You'd be paying 69 cents a city, and you'd probably be paying another 70 to live in that community. But then they'd use that money to do the whole thing. And Tom's right. That is kind of the wave of the future. That's, what's get, that's how Viridian got done. If people are moving into Viridian all day long. Well, here's the part that bothers me. If the developer lowered their lot costs because they didn't have to go use their own money to do the infrastructure, then it would all work out in the end. Yeah, you'd pay a double tax, but you'd be paying a less house payment. I just wonder how many of those developers... They're not paying a less house payment. I wonder how many are dropping their lot costs because they're getting that money. I'll let y'all... I, I just... Is that a fair assessment, guys? Something... They, they, gonna... They're paying market value over in Viridian. Guarantee you. But see, at least in Viridian, there was some justification in that floodplain. It was floodplain property, and a typical development process probably wouldn't work. And there may be pockets where that, that would work out in the ETJ. I would agree. And see, that's what I've said. Not everything fits that Viridian, but George and I have talked about we wish we could have partnered with Irving there along in that corridor where the floodplain, we had some floodplain they did, and we yeah. could work a deal to where somebody would come in like a Viridian, who cares? But the same same plan to get that out of the floodplain, and uh, because you're taking something that's not worth anything and making it valuable. Council Member Clemson, you're next on the clock. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I love having a master plan and I love being able to plan ahead. And I want to go back to what Councilman Lopez, uh, his concern, his first comment, because we all have that concern, that we don't want to invest in a project that would take away from the quality of life of our citizens uh, now. We want to keep all of that, um, we want to keep that moving in the right direction too. And, uh, but this is so far, ahead we must plan ahead and um, I love the fact that by doing this we are controlling our own destiny we can't control everything but at least this gives us a, a head start on controlling our own destiny now if you, if someone would just tell tell us we've talked about all the uh, positives of doing this what is the downside? Cost. Can we afford it? Cost. Infrastructure, police, fire. And what, anything else uh, as far as development? Will it be hodgepodge and not a, I was just thinking about the development. I, I think this organizes the development and into a unified vision that we can uh, present. As Bill mentioned, we're going to do this for the entire city. 
I think also another thing uh, to mention, the developers are already wanting to develop down there. We they saw are. this with Rodney DeBond's development. Quite frankly, we weren't quite ready for that development. <coughs> if, if you really look at the infrastructure, so that this really got us to thinking it's going to come down there whether we want it or not whether we like what's going to come down there or not or whether we're ready for it or not so the strategy was you know what let's be proactive let's get ready for it and i'll say it again let's try to control our own destiny and what council sees is what uh, would be best for our city down there and so yes ma'am i think the mayor mentioned the, the it's all about the money but i do believe that if we develop it smartly and we're able to acquire the ETJ in the right manner that certainly we should be able to pay for it. We're already preparing for fire service down there. Uh, Chief Sesney is already working on additional police beat. So th those uh, preparations are already underway. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Mr. Good, and that's, uh, Council, this is one of the reasons why we did this on a special night so we wouldn't be, okay, it's fixing to be 6.30, we gotta start our meeting. Any, uh, we wanted to have some time to discuss all this. It's a clean slate down there. Uh, years ago, it was way down there. It's not way down there anymore. They're, <laughs> they're building everywhere. The Middle Othian is growing so fast now. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Let me share one quick <coughs> piece of history from 21 years ago when your mother and I stood out on that property down there off of 287 because you had to have a public hearing on the property to annex property. So that we were physically out standing in a field having a public hearing. And there was a, a people had a chance to speak and there was a lady that apparently lived on a farm or something down there. And I could pretty much tell from her comments she was not enamored with coming into the city of Grand Prairie. And she spoke, and one of the two best citizen quotes I've heard in my whole career, she looked at the council and she said, I needed that Grand Prairie Police Department one time, and I called them, but I could have shot them, buried them, and forgot them before they got there. <laughs> 21 years ago. Any, anybody else got anything? <laughs> On, that note. On that note. Good job. Let's shift into the next one. Yes, sir. So as, as Rashad laid out, um, this study was done in, in response to um, both the housing moratorium and also some trends that, that we're seeing both in Grand Prairie and, and across the Metroplex. So this, this is really a, a deep dive into several different factors that um, affect the housing that's developed in the city and affect what's happening with the, the housing that's already here. Uh, so the project purpose um, really boils down to, to three different things. Uh, one is the, the need to study housing all across the city. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, housing varies depending on what part of the city you're in. Um, and then from that update, the policy related to housing, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the rezoning requests that, that you've been getting uh, uh, over the last five, six, seven years uh, to do high density housing, um, but also policy related to uh, redevelopment of areas that, that are already built. And then finally, to recommend some targeted um, amendments to the the future land use map we looked at a portion of that map in the the last presentation uh, this will cover the the rest of the of the city um, in terms of uh, providing some some needed updates to the to the map that was adopted in 2018 um, again for the the goal of uh, making sure that your housing as shown on the on the plan is is in alignment with the uh, with the, the market and the desires of, of the city um, so in looking at this you know we start with uh, the current conditions, similar to what we looked at with the last plan, we want to get an idea of uh, what's out there, um, what the market is providing, who's moving into the city, um, what the, the demographics are um, in terms of the, the social factors, housing as a response to you know people's uh, living conditions and, and need for need for housing. So what what do those folks look like? Who's who's here and, and who's moving into the city? We'll take a, a deeper dive into that in a little bit. 
Um, and then finally, um, overlaying that with uh, what we call best practices, you know, some do's and don'ts of, of housing, uh, how to make sure that the housing that, that you get and the housing that you approve is as good as, as it can possibly be, uh, not just on paper, but also for the people who actually have to live there and spend uh, every day uh, every day there in the environment that, the, that they're in. And of course, um, uh, making sure that from a fiscal standpoint that that, that housing is, is paying for the investments that the, that the city is, is making. Um, so we'll start with a, uh, a snapshot of uh, both the housing that, that exists uh, in the city and, and also the, the residents and potential residents. Uh, so we mentioned uh, earlier, you know, looking at, at the, the citywide housing numbers, um, these two charts break down what you've already got developed in terms of uh, different tiers of housing. We usually look, that, look at that in terms of density, which is the number of units um, for a given acre, um, and then comparing that to, to the undeveloped residential. So the, there's still about 7,300 um, acres left uh, undeveloped as shown on the, the future land use map today. Um, that's still quite a bit of, of undeveloped land. Uh, granted, uh, much of it is, is in the area that we just looked at on South 360, but the, there's other areas within the city as well. Um, most of that acreage uh, comes in the form of low density residential, uh, but there, there's some in, uh, across the other categories uh, as well. Particularly that high density residential number is of, of particular interest with a little under 700 acres uh, left to develop. Uh, with the density that's that's been occurring uh, within the city and, and the development pressure that, that's happening, um, you know, that land starts to starts to get uh, pretty precious, but, but also has implications in terms of what your ultimate build out is. Um, so your, your citywide housing numbers uh, from, uh, from the standpoint of what your population projection is, uh, you know, multifamily compared to, to single family, we've seen that because development is, is getting denser, um, even the projections that were made three years ago, uh, you know, we've had to adjust those, uh, adjust those higher uh, based on the, the prevailing density of the, the projects that have, been, uh, that have been approved since then. The projects that are under construction are, are ready to permit. Um, those, those, uh, those projections have gone up quite a bit. Um, so you know, asking about population projections, it's easy to envision a scenario where the city ultimately builds out at you know, 300,000, maybe, really? maybe even more. Um, if densities keep going up. So in terms of you know, guiding, guiding the market, uh, making sure that the development and housing decisions that, that are made um, fit within the, the city's fiscal capacity um, and also, frankly, you know, provide good housing and provide good environments uh, so that an area like South 360 or like 161 or like downtown becomes an attractive district um, you know, full of destination uses that people want to come to from Grand Prairie and from outside Grand Prairie. Uh, you know, it's it, it's necessary to, to make some very targeted um, recommendations uh, to look at things in, in a very targeted way. Um, as we mentioned before, um, Grand Prairie is kind of unique in terms of how long and skinny it is, um, but not all of Grand Prairie is the same when it comes to development patterns, when it comes to housing. I'm sure I'm stating the obvious there, but um, it is important from an analysis standpoint that we, uh, we look at smaller chunks of, of the city. So this lays out the analysis zones that, that we looked at. These are selected based on the housing that's within those, those areas. We wanted to compare similar um, areas in terms of housing, in terms of demographics, the folks who are living there, um, and economic considerations. So this kind of formed the basis of, of looking at housing and will form the basis of the, the recommendations that you'll see in a moment. Um, so kind of with that in mind, um, we, we looked at uh, demographics um, in terms of the, the folks who live in these areas. You know, what is their income? Uh, what, what is the, the cost of housing within these areas? Uh, what's their household size? Uh, how long does it take uh, to, to get to work? Um, how much of your income are, are you spending on housing? So a picture starts to emerge, uh, you know, where you, you get to the, the northern and southern <laughs> extremes of, of the city, you know, economically um, a little bit healthier uh, in terms of housing, in terms of the, the housing value. Uh, but then once you get closer to, to the center of the city, uh, that, that economic equation, you know, starts, starts to get a, get a little dicier. Um, so kind of with, with that in mind, that, that kind of speaks to the, to the housing side of things. Um, getting into the, to the economic summary, um, you know, we, we start to see that um, on the, the non-residential side that many of these areas kind of mirror the, uh, the, the housing um, profile where... Boy, that dark green is hard to read the black against it. Oh, 
so the yeah on, on the on the far south uh, as you would expect uh, you know you've, you've got kind of your, your healthier uh, economic areas and really you can just look in the the right hand column you know at, at the at the score um, to kind of see here are the the more economically healthy areas and, and here are the areas that are, that are struggling a little bit you know both from a residential and non-residential standpoint so marrying up good policy from a housing standpoint and from a non-residential standpoint um, is is really the goal to kind of bring up both of both of those factors so Jason's going to going to talk a, a little bit about um, the the trends that we're seeing both at the national and the state level. Thank you, David. I just uh, wanted to sort of emphasize that the world's changing. I, I think we all recognize that. But um, while we're having uh, really an unprecedented, unprecedented growth in, in terms of housing, a substantial portion of that continues to continue to increase in terms of multifamily. And I know that's one of the sort of the questions on the table. Um, with that being said, uh, as development continues to increase, we're having really unprecedented vacancies. Uh, so that's affecting supply. Obviously, that's continued to increase the price and then you increase uh, or decrease some of the durables. That, that obviously has a, a compounding effect. Um, so we can see that you know, inventory now is, is really you know, getting under that two-month level. Um, that's putting a lot of strain and pressure. That's creating some of the development pressure that we talked about on the south side. But as again, if you look at the chart on the right, um, we're seeing that price uh, continues to increase um, uh, at, a, at a very high velocity, uh, certainly in Dallas-Fort Worth, where we're seeing a lot of the job growth uh, and where the infrastructure is available. Um, building permits, uh, we continue to increase um, uh, Texas-wide, both single-family and multifamily permits. But you can see the, the disproportionate share of, of single-family and multifamily starting to sort of decrease. Um, and that really reflects the chart that I showed earlier is, is people are actually preferring to rent or having to rent just because of affordability issues. And I think that's driving some of the decisions that, uh, that's driving uh, this initiative. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to recognize is this isn't an isolated event. Um, the chart on the right shows the percentage of occupied housing. Um, we're seeing a lot of cities shift uh, where the majority of those are non-owner occupied cities now. Uh, places like Irving uh, have a higher proportionate share of renters uh, than they do owners. And you can see uh, the change in, in uh, renter-occupied housing. Uh, that's certainly affected Grand Prairie now at 11 percent, which is higher than the national average. Um, you can see on the chart uh, on the right um, the historical percentage of multifamily uh, in terms of residential. Uh, and you can see back in 2013 that was about 13 percent. Um, in 2021, that was about 71% of your applications were for multifamily. So again, um, that, so Irving is 65, 65% rent or occupied. That's correct. Um, so when we're, we're seeing that change dramatically across Dallas Fort Worth. We're right there in the mix of everybody else, except for, the, you know, the, Frisco the and Mansfield. Cities. Yeah, correct. But you can see even, even the percentage growth, um, and change of rent or occupied, both Frisco and Mansfield are, or have a, you know, a pretty moving. strong velocity. They're moving. So. And, and a lot of that is driven by apartments, but maybe not all of it, because this is looking yeah. at renters. Well, that's true. Honor. Yeah. Because yes. Mansfield has got a lot of apartments yeah. going up, too. We that's correct. We're seeing a, a lot of, you know, commercial-grade investors investing in housing um, to, to rent out, you know, in addition to individuals. Uh, and really, this is a perfect time to, to look at this. As you can see, uh, I just uh, placed on the map the arrow showing where, where we're really hitting the highest velocity of growth, and that's where... Uh, a lot of the urban cities are, are infill and, and revitalization stage. Um, you're in that state uh, and sort of the northern uh, part of the city, but the southern part of the city is, is still has a lot of room for opportunity and build out, and it's really time to think about uh, appropriate housing and, and land use. And uh, so I think you know, both of these studies are really critical in terms of timing for, for you for sure. Quick question. Yes, sir. Do we have a study on, on the, the percent, the high percentage of renters, what the average age is? Uh, I have both income and affordability range. I don't know that I have that in, in tonight's discussion, but I'm happy to provide you that. Do you have an idea of what that average age? You know, um, we're seeing uh, across the board a uh, high increase in renters, both in retirement stages. Um, I'm an empty nester, and I'm renting out of choice right now. Um, and then Let me ask you this for you. Not to ask your idea, Sure. You're, you're renting. Is it because you don't want to deal with the maintenance, that you're, more, you're a lot busier, that you don't have time to cut the yard or deal with it or you like to travel does that all come into play because 
it does I hear a lot of that from young professionals now. It, it does and, and there's security involved in renting i know that the management's taken care of but i live in an urban environment and there's security in place and so you know having other neighbors and in the security that that provides is is, right. is an amenity for me yeah, so, you right. know to, to your point mike if i may yeah, yeah, sure. y'all y'all know um james castles maybe you don't he lived here in town forever his wife tragically died of a heart attack when they were on their honeymoon, um, not, not their anniversary cruise, uh, very well to do, had a horse run in the Kentucky Derby, I mean that type of deal. I saw him at Lone Star Park the other day, ran into him. He's living in an apartment in Las Colinas. He said, I don't want to hassle with anything. I love the house when Fran and I were there, sold it, sold everything, living in an apartment. Because that, to your point, he can afford anything he wants. Right. But it's just the he just wants, he wants the ease right. of it. Well, you look at, you know, millennial, first way. He looked great. Example. Now you're talking about he David. but David, <laughs> you look at David. Party of four over there. Barely millennial. But that's a lot of it is, hey, they would rather, instead yeah. of cutting the yard at 7 a.m. on Saturday, they'd rather be, you know, out and about. They just don't want that. How and, do we find that happy medium yeah. of, not taking off the neighborhood around there like yeah, <laughs> but at the same time we, we'll, you know, I'll, 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 I'll put it on the record yeah. right now we could any zoning change for multifamily is going to get people right. against it we can talk it to is. them until we're blue right. in the face yeah. they don't like it right it's a, it's a, a hatred yeah, it's it's yeah. and, no. and thank goodness for this council and I, rec I commend a lot of you Cole, Georgia, John, each one of you have voted for zoning changes for mf where you thought it was responsible and good the one that you did cold rebecca and i drive by it all the time that's a beautiful looking and there was no business for it being anything else but we had citizens here saying no y'all approved it you got unanimous uh but those decisions are tough and that's why it's yeah. hard to say we're never going to approve another one or we're going to approve them all. No, you got to look at them on a case by case yeah. basis. But you're right on. <laughs> it ain't easy. It's not. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about some policy. We've, we've made a lot of recommendations in terms of a uh, broad range of housing and recommendations. I think it'll be helpful for this discussion. So, you, you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> Unfortunately, you didn't vote for it. I was the one. Well, you, well I, I, I had to exclude myself, but you didn't put a motion on the floor to do that. Yeah, Jeff did. Yeah. You, 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 you did that. Yeah. I was in the back room. It does look great. It is, yeah. It's a good place. If it goes downhill, we'll, we'll anyway. Um, as, as discussed, uh, I think you know, population is around 200,000 for Grand Prairie. We talked a little bit about build out, and again, uh, as the, the market continues to change, um, but we actually ran some forecast numbers. I think the, the highest number we have based on velocity is about 346,000. Uh, and again, I think you could uh, exceed that number if you continued housing trends with, with some of the development patterns that we're seeing today. Um, one of the things that we wanted to express is that, you know, really the, there's a lot of diversity. Um, I think the first analysis that David showed you recognized that, but uh, there's a lot of diversity in, in terms of home values across these sectors. Um, that's going to affect affordability. We, we talked a little bit about that um, uh, earlier. We're kind of in line with all the other first spring cities on that. that we that's have correct. the older, older stock that's 10,000 square foot. But are still getting $140 a square foot right now. And, and you can all see the, the we, we spent some time benchmarking a number of cities and, and essentially I like that. Grand Prairie's in red. You can see that, you know, across the board for the most part that you guys are very uh, consistent with, with the number of cities. Uh, they, you know, Frisco's probably the outlier. They, they've got fewer numbers of, of, of affordable housing and, and sort of a peak of, of, uh, of higher end housing. We, we talked about some opportunities to increase that number where those enclave and then those, those natural areas that I think would be very appropriate. Um, but there's a lot of places within the city that will recommend um, that you guys could do some context sensitive housing that I think would be very attractive and very appropriate to serve a, a broader audience. Uh, and again, um, we, we talked a little bit about the, the nuances in qualifying incomes. The, the city, you know, there, there's really a number of cities within the city uh, when you think about these character districts and, and, and the, really the, the qualified income that it would take to drive uh, some of the market. Um, 
in fact, even in the southern end, if you looked at the MLS sales and, and the qualifying numbers, um, the median home value uh, based on affordability and income is, is around 253. But if you went back and looked at MLS data, obviously, uh, there's not many houses that are selling below, below that number on, this, on the southern sector today. Um, so we've spent some time looking at um, uh, the demand by age. Uh, you, you asked about you know, some of the age and, and affordability and propensity. Uh, propensity. Uh, so this go, gives you a, a distribution of both demand for uh, owner-occupied or single family uh, by age. And you can see really it's across the board, but there are some uh, higher income earners that, that could afford to buy at, at the upper echelon of the market. Um, but again, same thing with, with rental. Um, there's a lot of demand for rentals across the board, but the age 35 to 54 again has uh, higher capacity for uh, huh. and, and maybe desire to, to rent as well uh, just for the elasticity of choice. So uh, some of the big uh, issues and opportunity. Um, obviously, if you looked at the percentage uh, increase in applications, uh, the amount of growth in multifamily, I think that's something that, that we need to manage. But again, sort of it's a double-edged uh, sword because there's a higher propensity of people that desire and, and want to rent. And there's a lot of folks that, that, that need to rent uh, as a choice and, and as a requirement. Uh, but you have a very limited amount of land left to develop out. And so how do you create an equitable solution and a balanced solution that accommodates uh, essentially and maximizes economic opportunity but also helps you build out in the city in a responsible way? Um, as you get further north, there's a lot of aging infrastructure and, and housing stock that needs to be looked at. And so part of this initiative will be looking at ways and implications to increase the housing quality of the neighborhoods. And I think that's just as important as managing the growth of the south is how to take care of the existing development that you have in the north. What are the services that are needed and, and, and what are some of the redevelopment and revitalization strategies that can help prop up some of the existing neighborhoods. Um, overall, I think, you know, strategically location is uh, really hard to compete with. You can be in Dallas in 20 minutes and Fort Worth in, in 20 or 30 minutes. Um, I think your, your level of investment in, in both community development and quality of life is uh, amazing. Projects like Epic are going to be regionally and, simp uh, and, uh, and create uh, a really a, a destination for a number of people. Uh, and then, as you know, because of where you sit in position and just the, the growth that we're going to have in Dallas-Fort Worth, you're going to have growth. It's just how do you manage that and how you deal with it. And I think uh, that's both an issue and opportunity. Um, I'm going to let David talk a little bit about uh, vit uh, vicious and virtuous cycles and then uh, get into some of the ha housing uh, character and quality across the board. So we're going to transition from kind of the, the dry numbers based stuff. Uh, thank you for bearing with us through that. And, and we're going to get more into, you know, what is what does housing look like and, and you know, who, who are the folks who, who are looking for housing? It, to kind of set the stage for that, I mean, it's it's important to um, to think about uh, the life cycles that that housing goes through, uh, you know, just like people go through go through life cycles. Uh, neighborhoods start off, you know, shiny and new with with a lot of investment. Everybody out there on the weekend mowing their yard. Mr. Dobosky, I'm out there with him. I'm mowing my yard every Saturday, and you know, you have a nice, stable neighborhood. You've got all first generation owners. Uh, you know, you don't you don't have absentee landowners, um, but over time. Um, you know the complacency starts to starts to set in. Um, you know neighborhood decline starts starts to set in as as homes fall into disrepair, as the maintenance burden becomes too great for for certain owners, or some of them transition over to, to renters, and there's absentee ownership. Um, the city is you know having to spend money to repair the streets, or if it's an HOA, they're having to do a special assessment to replace the fountain or replace the pool, and costs burden kind of starts growing and, and the decline starts taking over. Um, eventually, as you know, development pressure shifts to other areas of the city, um, jobs start to start to shift. Uh, some of those older areas, uh, they start to redevelop, um, or you know, we might call it gentrify, where um, you know, they, they're well located to areas that, that people want to be in, like Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, so they start to demand a price premium, and then they start to appreciate again, and the cycle starts over. So the goal with this is, is to keep housing as much as possible within the virtuous cycle rather than, than the vicious cycle and make sure we're identifying areas that are kind of transitioning the, the wrong way and that we have strategies for those to, to mitigate against that. Um, so in, in looking at the principles of, of high quality housing, this is kind of where, where we start to take stock of, of what we have in the city today um, and how to address some of those, some of those trends um, that, that we've talked about. 
So just like we divided the city into, into different sectors uh, for analysis, we wanted to divide uh, the housing that exists in, into different, uh, different types as well. So the oldest housing in, in the city um, that the mayor alluded to really started to, to build up um, you know, when the, the Vought plant um, was right. employing thousands of people. That's what you see basically you know, in, in, a, in a line along um, Highway 180 to the north and south. Uh, there's a lot of that concentrated in, um, in the, the central part of the city. Uh, workforce housing, you know, there, there's nothing in, inherently wrong with it. You know, no one is saying that, that, that it's bad, but when you drive around those neighborhoods, you can see that there's various levels of repair and disrepair um, with, with some of these homes. Again, you know, get back to the to the cost burden, or, or get back to the fact that you know folks are having to drive a long way to, to get to work, or um, or a number of factors uh, in those areas. Contrast that with you know what you see basically outside the the center part of the city, where you've got post-war housing. Uh, tends to be bigger, tends to be on larger lots. Uh, many of them have HOAs, so there's a lot of strict architectural controls. Um, but even in those cases, we're starting to see some of that uh, post-war suburban housing start to go through that, that vicious cycle. Of course, the, the one that, that has become really familiar over the past few years is uh, what we're calling multifamily islands. That's not indicative of all multifamily. Um, but what we're really talking about here is uh, pieces of land typically along freeways or, or in areas where maybe there's a larger plan for development um, where you have that rooftops then retail um, kind of model of, of development and there's demand for the multifamily but the demand for the retail is lagging. So what you end up with is uh, the, the picture uh, on the right there is probably most illustrative. Uh, you have an apartment complex and it might be a fine apartment complex, uh, but it's surrounded by a freeway and it's surrounded by empty land. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of that in the city, both that was approved over the past few years and, and some that was, was approved well before that. And then the fourth one is what we're calling contextual density. And with this one, we're not so much focused on a specific type of development. The word density doesn't necessarily imply that it's you know, high density apartments. Uh, just that this is housing that exists within an environment where there's a lot of other stuff. Um, could be retail, could be restaurants, jobs, parks, schools, um, libraries, a lot, a lot of activities that people can, can get to in a, in a short amount of time. Um, and it has a wide range of, of housing, uh, again, to, to speak to that, uh, that lifestyle factor. Um, so we've talked a little bit about it. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Dabowski, for kind of bringing it up. You know, the, the demographic profiles of uh, the folks who are moving to Grand Prairie. Some of these you already have in, in great numbers. Um, you have a lot of young families in Grand Prairie. Some of those are, are kind of lacking, particularly folks who went away to college and they're coming back um, or they're finding a, a place to settle, um, like Tony and Abigail here. Um, you know, they're the, they're the starter family. They might not have kids, but, you know, they, they want to have kids or maybe they have fur babies, um, but they're kind of, you know, on, on the fence about whether to get something with a big yard or a small yard. They don't want to spend a lot of time maintaining, um, but they know they want a safe, quiet neighborhood with safe streets. So they're probably looking at single family detached. Um, there's a lot of that available in Grand Prairie um, along a, a wide um, range of prices. Um, or they might be looking at what we've come to call hybrid housing. I was around when we started calling it hybrid housing, but um, it kind of seems like a new concept, but really there's examples of older hybrid housing, meaning from the 70s and 80s here in Grand Prairie, uh, right off of Beltline. That's the picture on, on the left, um, where you have the model of uh, smaller, maybe attached or detached units that are renter, um, and it's, it's one floor, it's not stacked like apartments, and it has shared green space. Uh, so th these are these are two potential housing types that that someone in this that fits this uh, stage of life uh, might might be looking for. It fulfills the need for a yard, fulfills the need for a, a quiet neighborhood, um, and particularly with single family detached, it starts to build some equity. Now, if you know they they don't want to they they aren't concerned about building equity. Maybe they want to spend all, all their their extra money on travel, you know, they, they might look look more towards a uh, multifamily. This one in particular, we're, we're calling Gerben. It's kind of a combination of a uh, garden style, uh, which we have uh, a lot of that uh, was built in the 70s and 80s, and, and urban style. It comes in a lot of different forms. 
um, and really you, you have to be careful uh, the, the way you design it or else it, it does start to look like these big big apartment blocks um, and as we mentioned already have to be careful about you know not just locating them on freeways and, and areas where the only advantages are that well you can get somewhere else really quickly so uh, what about Meredith, uh, the, the service worker? You know, we might, we might call, call them uh, blue collar, um, you know, works nights, uh, maybe at a coffee shop, um, walks her daughter to school, uh, maybe goes to the library to, to use broadband access, you know, to, to save money. Um, what type of housing is, is this person looking for? Um, you know, maybe more attracted to, to urban infill. Um, you know, in, in this case, smaller um, types of uh, types of apartments or, or row houses that are in affordable areas may not be in the best. Um, you know, the, the best area that somebody who has a lot of choice would, would go to, but a lot of things are around. Uh, there's, there's a lot of amenities there, a lot of free events um, that, that she can take her daughter to. The farmer's market is nearby. Um, you know, might be, might be attracted to, to that type of housing. Um, other end of the spectrum, we've got Mitch, uh, the executive. Um, he, can, he can live every, anywhere, but he likes the central location of, of Grand Prairie. Um, needs to be close to the office. Um, crucially, he's got a lot of friends. He wants to be able to entertain um, either at his house or, or to go to a restaurant down the street. Uh, might be more interested in new urban mixed use. Um, $2,000 rents don't, don't bother him. Um, he just wants to have a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff nearby. Um, or he might be more attracted to the, the luxury traditional type of housing, as, as we already mentioned, the gated enclave, um, you know, where, where there's a, a lot of open space, a lot of green space, all the homes are custom built, um, and, you know, the, the prices, uh, you know, mean that, that um, he's, he's, got a, he's got a lot of amenities. And then we have the empty nesters, uh, Steph and Gary. So they're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from Tony and Abigail. Um, they're empty nesters. Uh, they have fur babies. Um, they traded their kids for dogs. And uh, <laughs> Gary likes to work on classic cars. He still wants a garage. They still like to potentially have the equity of owning their own home. Um, so they're looking for owner-occupied townhomes. Very low maintenance. Um, you get some efficiencies built in, but uh, you can also turn around and sell, cash out, and uh, buy an RV if you potentially want to. Um, so that this might be a might be a housing type that, that they're interested in. So knowing that you've got these folks, you know, living in, in your city, it kind of takes a nuanced housing policy to make sure that you know we're providing for all these different uh, ranges of folks. And you think back to the different strata of the the city that we looked at, that certain um, residents are going to be more concentrated in certain areas of the city. So what's a quality housing strategy that can address all of these types? Is there something that's universal that uh, makes for high quality, high quality housing regardless of type? You know, the traditional approach um, really over the last 60 or 70 years uh, within the U.S. Um, has been to go out and develop in, in green fields, uh, single use uh, uh, zoning to where you have your residential district, your commercial district. Um, the rooftops and retail approach that, that we mentioned earlier. If you build the residential, then the retail will follow. An alternative strategy that, that we want to look at is now that you know Grand Prairie is starting to build out, it's not there yet, but you have a lot of freeways in the city, you have a lot of uh, ar large arterial roads. Um, those make for good commercial corners, which, uh, which have developed. Um, but there's still housing that's, that's far away, forces folks to drive, um, that means that you're spending a lot of money um, on driving and, and, a, and a lot of money on getting where you need to go. So focusing housing closer to those centers of, of activity um, is, is a housing approach we, we want to look at just to see what the, what the benefits are in terms of uh, efficiency, uh, efficiencies of cost and, and energy usage. Um, and then the compact approach, uh, which, is, which is a term for uh, building housing in areas that are already developed but you know, there may be efficiencies to be gained by taking a large lot, dividing it into two, building two units where, where you might have one, or building on end caps, which is, which is something we'll look at in, in a moment. So taking these strategies and starting to, to outline them in the city and seeing where different, different types of, of housing could go, this doesn't exclude any one particular type of housing. It, it's really designed to, to allow for all different types. Um, but we start to look at 
um, the impacts of, of these different approaches on uh, things like household energy usage, household water usage. So again, when we focus housing on, on areas uh, where there's already activity, where you're not going into a, a green field and um, you know, like we talked about uh, in, with the 360 plan, uh, going in and disrupting existing neighborhoods uh, by building apartments next to them, but focusing around areas of activity, uh, there starts to be uh, big advantages in terms of uh, energy usage, water usage, because you have smaller lots, um, you have units that are next to each other, so there's efficiencies to be gained um, in terms of uh, energy usage, heating and cooling. Um, the compact pattern, we, we see small gains there, but um, you know, basically we're, we're repeating the, the pattern um, from before with the traditional approach. Where we do see gains is in terms of uh, annual auto cost by, um, by the, the type of development, uh, vehicle miles traveled because we're locating housing closer to existing uh, activity centers. Think about all the trips you make uh, in a given day to go to the grocery store, to go to work, um, to go to the library, to return that overdue book. Um, you know, if you're getting in your car and, and you're making all, all those trips, if we bring things closer to people and we bring housing closer to, to those centers of activity, um, we're reducing uh, household uh, vehicle miles and, and we're, we're making living more affordable, which in turn makes housing more affordable. Uh, park access, uh, this one is kind of a different sort of visualization, but the, the map on, on the left, uh, the, the darker shades indicate that uh, a given property is located uh, closer to uh, you know, more park acreage. Uh, so you want to live in the dark areas if you want access to a lot of park acreage. Um, so taking that, that infill approach, uh, that nodal approach where we're locating housing uh, closer to parks, closer to activity centers, starts to have uh, big gains in terms of getting people, um, getting people uh, better access to, to parks. And of course, that's, that's what we all want because Grand Prairie has made such a tremendous investment in its parks. You know, we want to make sure that, that we get as many people as close to them as possible. So it boils down to, to these six principles. Um, you know, essentially making sure that we're building the, the housing that, that people want in the right context. Um, identifying everyday destinations. Um, you know, not talking about going to Disney World, but talking about going to CVS, going to the pharmacy, uh, going to work. Um, removing barriers uh, between housing and getting to those services. And the example that, that I, I always think of is when you drive down uh, a road and you see an elementary school and then there's subdivisions that back to that elementary school with a wall that goes, that goes around it. There's a good reason for that wall. Um, you know, it, it, it creates privacy, it, it creates a quieter environment, but you're also making the compromise of folks having to get in their car and drive their kids to school, which makes getting to school more dangerous for, for kids who are on foot. So what's the solution? Um, making sure there's a sidewalk access that, that gets to, that, gets to that, that school. So that's what we mean by removing barriers. Um, avoiding new housing near threats and nuisances, you know, I think industrial areas or concrete batch plants, uh, thing, things of that nature. Um, allow for adaptation of residential areas over time um, and then provide residents more to enjoy and less to maintain. I'll only go through one, one example of, of applying these principles. Um, what, what we did with staff was kind of sit down through each of these zones and say, hey, there's areas where each of these principles are already being applied, but, or we could apply them. But we're, we're going we're gonna to take a, a really good example um, in the south central sector of, of the city. Um, Pioneer Parkway between Carrier and, and Beltline. You know, it's, it's an area that was the preeminent commercial area uh, in the center part of the city before 161 went in. Still a healthy retail environment. Um, and it's an environment that has a, a lot of different uh, types of housing. So you see applications of these different principles. There's housing in context. Uh, it's close to services. It's away from threats and nuisances. Uh, you know, you, you think of Poly America and, uh, and Lockheed Martin, great users, uh, you know, great, uh, great businesses in, in Grand Prairie, but you know, they don't have housing right next to them like, like we do in some areas of the city. Um, and then uh, providing, uh, again, more to enjoy and less, less to maintain. Think of that older hybrid housing that, that we looked at a, a second ago. So zooming in, you see grocery stores in yellow, you see jobs in, in red, and then you see schools uh, outlined in green. So a good distribution with, with housing um, all around these uses, uh, particularly the schools. So we do a walk analysis and, and we, we take, uh, take a, a duplex here on Santa Barbara and you know, we want to find out how, how long does it take to, to 
walk to the grocery store. I mean, it takes me about 15 minutes to drive to the grocery store. But if you live in this neighborhood, you know, you can walk to Kroger within 15 minutes. And that's even with the, the dead end street that's, that's blocked off um, with, the, with the yellow X. You know, it would be a lot quicker if you could go that way. But still, it takes you 15 minutes to get to the grocery store. That's, that's not always common in, in Grand Prairie. In fact, it's, it's pretty uncommon in Grand Prairie and in a lot of cities in the Metroplex. Um, you can walk to uh, the Grand Prairie ISD Family Service Center in, in 12 minutes. I don't know if you'd want to because that would mean you'd have to cross uh, Pioneer Parkway and, and Beltline. So that kind of gets back to, to removing barriers or, or you know, making it easier to get around. Uh, fortunately, the city is, is studying Pioneer um, and, and uh, you know, a great plan for, for that will, will come out of that effort. Um, but the, the, the point is you, you could do it because these, these services are, are located close to, close to housing. This type of housing uh, used to be built more commonly. Uh, that, that area that we just looked at was you know, largely built out in the 70s and, and the 80s. Um, since 2010, only 6.3% of, of the existing housing stock of this type um, has, has been built. Um, so we're slowing down in, in terms of you know, providing these types of neighborhoods. We're, we're building you know, largely subdivisions that are within areas of other residential. Uh, and, and services are, are getting a little farther away. So, you know, in, in terms of housing policy, um, finding areas of, of the city that, that are close to services, uh, focusing housing in those areas. Here's a good example um, on, on Royal Lake of new housing that's being built close to schools. And the, the thing to take away from this is that it doesn't have to be a certain type of housing. It doesn't have to be multifamily or, or duplex or townhomes. Any type of housing can can benefit from uh, benefit from being well located, uh, you know, in, in areas that uh, that have existing services. So, from a policy standpoint, when developer comes to comes to council and, and asks for a rezone to, to higher density housing, you know, the, the first thing you can look at is well, what's within a quarter mile of it? You know, is it, is it just well located to the freeway so they can get to Dallas and Fort Worth, or are we providing uh, more potential users for our retail areas, for our parks, our libraries, and other things that the city has invested in? The the diagram on the screen I've, I've showed it a, a couple of times, and you know you you may have heard the term missing middle housing. Um, th there's a whole universe of, of housing in between what we normally see on the spectrum of detached single family housing and, and multifamily. It's, it's a false choice to think, well, we can only have one or the other. Uh, not that you have to have all these different types of, of housing, but the more you have, the more affordable you know, the, the housing tends to be um, you know, in, in areas where that's an issue. And uh, the, the more that in, in areas where affordability isn't an issue, you know, the, the more you'll, you'll start to see what we talked about with the 360 plan where you get that multi-generational appeal because people are aging through that area uh, where they don't have to leave and you know you have multi-generational households um, and and you have you have continuous investment in those areas where they don't get built all at the same time and then they don't all decline at the same time going back to that uh, that vicious cycle versus vir virtuous cycle so real quick, because I, I know we're running, we're running short on time, but uh, I want to start with some universal recommendations. Many of these we've, we've kind of already gone through, so I won't belabor the point, but uh, then going from there to kind of some district-specific recommendations. Um, so again, we talked about nodes and major intersections. This could be freeway intersections. You know, think of Great Southwest Parkway and, and 20, um, or Beltline and, and Pioneer, or Beltline and 30. Uh, these are areas that, that really benefit from master planning housing so that the, the timing is, is worked out so that you don't have those multifamily islands that, that we talked about, well located to, to, to services, um, well located to non-residential uh, uses, you know, avoiding the, the concentration of, of one particular use that, that increases vehicular trips, that increases cost burden on households and uh, you know, impact on the environment. Um, and then finding ar areas that, that are already developed where, you know, say there's, there's a street intersection and, and you have some vacant lots that face that major street, maybe they're zoned commercial. Um, you know, if, if they've been vacant for, for uh, a long time um, and, and there's housing pressure there, that potentially is a good location to, to locate uh, some, some higher density housing on those, on those end caps. 
um, you know, per, particularly if there's there's areas that you're focusing on, like like downtown or like the Main Street corridor. So in greenfield areas, uh, you know, from a policy standpoint, making sure that that there's an anchor, um, that there's a that there's a jobs generator or or an institution, um, and these are these are the types of areas where you know you're going to get pressure to rezone them for for multifamily and from a from a policy standpoint saying hey we either need a jobs concentration here so that people aren't going to dallas and fort worth or it stays commercial uh, you know making making that kind of a kind of a policy decision um, again getting back to the need to master plan these these areas you know to to make sure that there's the appropriate context for housing and not just rezoning it in a in a vacuum, um, so if if a mixed use area isn't going to be isn't going to be created, if there's not an anchor that's going to be created, you know, leaving those areas leaving those areas commercial um, along those those major corridors. Um, so getting getting to the to the sector recommendations, I'll, I'll go through these uh, I'll go through these quickly. Uh, you know, starting in the the north sector. Um, Again, master planning housing on, on those remaining parcels, uh, making sure that, that there's alignment between um, public services and, and the housing that's being put in. You know, this is an area in, in particular where parks access a, is a challenge. Um, you know, the regional trail that, that follows the, the Trinity River will, um, will, will be a, a big amenity there. But, you know, this, this is an area that, you know, in terms of housing that's going in, it's likely going to be isolated. Uh, you're likely going to be seeing people who are driving a long way to, to get to work. Um, we certainly see that in the existing neighborhoods, um, that they're somewhat isolated. So stabilizing the, those neighborhoods, you know, if they don't have an HOA, if they don't have some institution in place, um, and then uh, allowing incremental density, particularly around the periphery of the urban core, you know, around Hill Street, um, you know, allowing for uh, some townhomes or some smaller apartments uh, to be built similar to, to what exists today. Um, urban core. I mean, th this is one that that we worked on with Catalyst a, a couple of years ago. Um, did the the downtown plan? Um, identified several areas uh, as gateways and transition zones, and then the core of downtown itself. Um, you know, one of the implementation actions of that plan was a um, uh, proactive rezoning by the city of of downtown to implement some of these housing strategies, uh, <coughs> making sure that the the commercial corners are reserved for commercial uses. Um, but that you also have the appropriate amount of, of residential in these areas. Density isn't quite as much a, of an issue here, um, you know, where, where you have uh, better on-street parking, where you have more things that, that you can walk to. Um, and then outside of, uh, of the Main Street corridor, uh, again, going back to, the, to those end caps, identifying areas where more residents can, uh, can be brought closer to downtown uh, on 3rd Street or Grand Prairie Road. Central sector. Um, you know, this, the, this again is, is an area that, that has a, a lot of that bought era housing that, that we talked about. So looking for distressed properties um, that can be redeveloped in a way that respects those neighborhoods, um, that doesn't drive out existing residents. Um, focusing commercial development, again, on, on the corners, um, but allowing for some residential uh, flexibility uh, in the, the mid-block portions. Um, there are areas uh, within uh, within this sector um, where there's a lot of potential for a jobs hub. You know, particularly at, at the hospital um, off of Great Southwest Parkway. There's uh, several undeveloped tracks um, in that area. It's already an area of mixed housing, uh, so focusing new uh, potentially higher density housing in those areas where it won't be disruptive and it'll be close to to jobs. South Central sector we we kind of already talked about. Um, you know, you're studying the the Pioneer corridor um, but there's there's a lot of services there parks uh, you know you have McFalls Park there but uh, having a few more neighborhood pocket parks uh, working with developers to provide those with it is, is a good strategy um, and then maintaining that uh, that existing housing balance um, and then getting new housing um, and mixed-use development close to anchors like uh, like Asia Times Square um, to, so that that you have more residents in closer proximity to those areas um, the I-20 corridor, uh, this is where a lot of multifamily development pressure uh, has, has occurred. Um, it's also an area where there's tremendous opportunity because there's, there's uh, uh, land at, at Beltline and 20 um, that has yet to be developed. Um, there's, there's still land at, at 20 and Great Southwest. Um, you know, there's, there's some older development there, older commercial development. Um, 
and combined with some newer housing that, that's coming in. So, you know, looking at that from, from the standpoint of getting more residents uh, in those areas will, will be important. Um, and then some, you know, building on, on your stream corridors. Fish Creek Linear Trail is a great amenity, uh, but it lacks north-south connectivity so that folks can't get north and folks from the north can't get south um, down to down to Fish Creek, which uh, Mr. Lopez, you know, kind of gets to what you were mentioning, uh, getting amenities, you know, in these in these existing areas of town and, and leveraging leveraging those conditions. Far south, um, you know, it's it's a much different area than, than a lot of the rest of the city. So avoiding again those multifamily islands, uh, making sure that new housing that's created uh, doesn't disrupt existing neighborhoods and, and is contextual. Um, you drive through that area now and, and a lot of the housing is in very good condition, um, but it's important to monitor that neighborhood health using HOAs and, and PIDs as a, as a resource um, to make sure that it's staying within that virtuous cycle. Um, and, and then uh, implementing the, the Southgate 360 plan as, as we discussed before. Um, Action items, um, you know, we, we really look at this in, in several, several different categories. Um, so, Jason, I'll, I'll have you cover the first two, and then, then I'll cover the next two. Yeah, I'll make this quick. We have a couple more slides. But one of the things is really just paying attention to the rental quality. I think, you know, looking at the balance, um, making sure that you continue to monitor. We've set up the baseline work already for all these districts. So uh, we've established the tools to allow you to understand uh, maybe when you're reaching or exceeding some of those thresholds. Um, and then really, I think building upon and expanding some of the programs uh, to make sure that uh, their services, needed services within in, in these individual areas. Um, one of the things that we're working on uh, in other places that I think would be helpful is, you know, creating a character based pattern book, really getting into the details and nuances of some of these areas and sub areas to uh, to create the appropriate character of housing and give some recommendations. Um, and then one of the things that we've been extremely successful in and partnering with other cities is creating a land bank program to help stimulate redevelopment revitalization. Um, that's been a tremendous gain. I know you guys are doing that on the, in, in the commercial side, but I think there's an opportunity to do that on the residential side in some very specific areas. So, Yes, yeah, to kind of build off of uh, what Jason is, is um, mentioning, you know, regulatory tools in, in terms of uh, you know, like we mentioned, the, looking at targeted city-initiated um, rezonings in key areas like downtown to uh, make it easier to build residential um, in those areas, uh, creating a, a housing overlay uh, potentially in, in the, the central sector of, of the city, you know, in the area where we saw a lot of the, uh, the Vought era housing um, that allows property owners to leverage more of their properties, you know, potentially by building accessory dwelling units or, or doing um, doing lot splits uh, with a, a more expedited process. Um, the, the housing department has also done a lot of work in that area. Um, you know, there's, there's existing housing there that, that we, can, we can align new housing with um, in a way that's respectful of the existing pattern. Um, continually evaluating, um, you know, making sure we're identifying those barriers to walkability and connections like we discussed before. Um, and then making sure that, you know, the zoning and, and future land use stay, stay aligned. Um, continually monitoring housing, uh, you know, under under accountability, you know, making sure there's a designated person um, that that is kind of the the housing guru for the city um, that that is monitoring these these factors and, and these metrics um, and and is applying them, um, and then looking at housing on an annual or semi annual basis, you know, to update our assumptions, um, to to look at you know to Jason's point, um, you know, the renter numbers that we're seeing if we implement a rental registration. Uh, making sure our, our housing health is going in the direction that it needs to go um, and that housing principles are, are being being applied through through development that both occurs by rezoning and some of the stuff that doesn't come to council like uh, you know plats and uh, and building permits uh, that those things all stay aligned and that we have a point person for that. Um, I do want to point out, um, as, as we mentioned, one of the things we've been working on with Rashad and, and his staff is, is identifying areas of the future land use map that, that we can improve. So there's lots of targeted sites that, that we've been looking at. Um, that That is, is something that we've gone through the initial stages of. So, so we have a, um, you know, a working land use map that, that will be implemented as part of this plan um, and, and have looked at several opportunity sites where we can apply some of these principles. Um, but that, that's, our, uh, that's our, our findings and, and recommendations that we want to present to you tonight, and uh, we'd be glad to, to have any other discussion or, or questions. That's a quick question. 
Councilmember Clemson. Just a quick question, uh, David. In our packet, unless I missed it, I didn't see the universal recommendations, the sector recommendations and action items. Could we get that yes. or, or did I just miss it? Um, uh, um, I didn't see that, but would you I, I can I can get it I can get it for you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll make the we'll make the presentation uh, available um, after tonight, and okay. same with the 360 as well. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Lopez. Uh, David, once again, thank you for the information. Um, you know, a couple of points just to point out, and not really going to discuss them, but I do appreciate you looking at neighborhoods, especially the older neighborhoods. Make sure that we have some type of uh, overlay districts you know try and protect them because a lot of them don't have PIDs or HOA and, and we don't want to make sure that we don't lose focus on, on the northern part of town and, and, and as things get developed you know then they start losing potential of home ownership and, mm -hmm. and attainable you know try and get in that area the other part also to consider around the urban core in their central sector is um, try to figure out what's happening with the, well, not, we know Hensley Field's gonna get developed eventually. Mm -hmm. City of Dallas is, is promoting that. We know that transportation will have to get to that site, whether it be rail, buses. So just think about the connection part, whether it be mixed use along 14th Street, something where we could draw in that aspect where residents that live there could come to Grand Prairie and spend their dollars in Grand Prairie, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also, you can have residents that live close by and have that connection and they can walk over and, and access DART or whatever rail system. But also there's talks of higher education also being part of that complex as well. Like a community college, um, I know that we're continue that discussion with them as well as part of that. So just. Yeah, great points. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for mentioning Hensley Field. That's Kind of exciting to watch what's going to happen there. Um, well, <laughs> it's been an interesting educational evening. We would have never been able to do this on a regular night, so I think this is great on the staffs uh, to do a special session like this. It's been very worthwhile, covered a lot of stuff. Rashad, you had your hand up. Just real quick, I think the key from this presentation is considering context with regard to these requests. David noted, you know, proximity to grocery, proximity right. to other developments. Not only those that they're gonna affect, but how are those people gonna live, the new residents, you know, their connections to these park sites and things of that nature. So we would add that on top of the existing future land use map. We have the right to say no based on the future land use map, whether it's a green field or not. Yeah. You know, vacant access to 161. If it's not providing anything outside of just multifamily, we have the right to say no, and it's no no benefit. So that's where we're getting with these recommendations. Um, I particularly like the idea and researched the idea of, and you know, we have a lot of, in the central core, um, downtown area, vacant lots, the VOD area, um, era development, um, this is a unique idea, but you know we have a lot of opposition and uh, concern with hybrid housing. Um, hybrid houses are essentially these small 1,600 square foot homes, townhomes, that could lend themselves as an opportunity to infill, be an infill opportunity mm -hmm. in these areas if the developers would be willing to do it. You already have the existing infrastructure. You're not necessarily um, creating a gentrification situation because the values won't, it's an improvement, but the value isn't a mini mansion next to these homes. Right. Um, it, it would, I understand what you're saying. There's some in locations it'd be, it, it could work. Yes, and the opportunity to do that outside of, I would rather, instead of rezoning and creating issues with existing development, create an overlays. That would be the best approach to create overlays, to create uh, opportunities. I like that, and, that's, and John was mentioning that, that, that it could be to help protect, but also <coughs> help allow some things in those areas we want to go there. Yes. 
Thanks, Rashad. So what about this just a uh, hypothetical? Manufactured homes. Now. No. Okay. <laughs> just after the Anybody else? Mayor, I'd just like to take a quick opportunity to thank Savannah, Rashad, David, and Jason. They put in a lot of hours together putting this together for you this evening. And I've learned a lot, and they've learned a lot, and we think that it's something that is good for the city. And as you have all note, said, noted tonight, planning is what it should be all about. That way that can guide the development of this city well into the future, and we can be the great city that we already are and go to greater heights. Thank you, Bill. Did uh, Eddie get to come home? He's at home. Good, thank you. His good friend Eddie Freeman that's on our sports corp had a tumor. Uh, I don't know if y'all know, he's, uh, uh, he and Bill were room roomies down in, at Texas. And Eddie serves on our, uh, had served on our housing finance corporation for years. That's where I met him. And he uh, is on our sports facilities corporation now, the secretary. And so I uh, got to come home yesterday. So that's very, very good news, Bill. Um, we have we have an agenda item to take care of. Wh who's the name? We're Rashad, sorry. Sorry, one last thing. Just to give everybody a heads up of what's coming, this is scheduled to be adopted by resolution on the August 17th council agenda. Unless this housing analysis presentation as yes. a resolution, yes. not an ordinance. Correct. Thank you, Rashad. Uh, Mona. Yes, sir. Who? Uh, so we have Janie Mendez out of poverty nominated by Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Humphreys to serve on the Building Advisory and Appeals Board. Okay. 